All right. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Tom. I'm deflating atheism. And <laughs> we have a third guy here. Yes. John, you with us? Yeah, I'm here. All right. So, um, this was basically... Uh, my... Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was, I was just basically my idea. I wanted to do a... Uh, a podcast sort of discussing uh, the messianic manic's views on abortion. So like some of his weird comments on there and so on. Right, right. And uh, there's, I myself agree to that completely. Um, I understand that uh, all of us, we, we tried to get this podcast started. I, we all saw what messianic manic made with these uh, abortion videos. I, I personally, I, I was, not always um i'm now a theist because i've been researching actually doing some actual science and researching into all this here i i uh basically i wanted to join on the john's podcast because i thought that maybe i can make a difference in this uh but what happened johan you you couldn't make the podcast and escaping atheism was he busy i guess right then i um, so I took it up the opportunity to do the podcast and yeah. Oh, do we have a fourth comer? That's Hello. Trevor. Uh, yeah, this is Trevor. Yeah. Trevor. Welcome Trevor. Hey guys. Yeah. I'm just trying to set my stuff up properly. Uh, yeah, I'm on my phone actually. I'm friends with Johanan. Great Trevor. Uh, welcome to the group. The more the merrier. Hey Trevor. What's up? All right, this is uh, so this is my. Who is all? Oh, who is everyone here? Uh, I'm not sure what channel we're on. <laughs> oh, uh, we're on my channel. I uh, you see, there's been, we were trying to get to escaping atheism to do a podcast with us, but he was busy. Uh, from what I heard from John, um, and so I just decided, uh, what the hell? I'll just make a channel myself, and here we are. This is on my channel called Tom Tom Hafner. My my name. Uh, it's not actual my real name. Hafner is my last name, but Tom, I just changed that personally. Oh, yeah. Uh, but but besides the point, um, I'm glad you came on here, Trevor. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your background, like who you are? Oh well, um, I took, I'm a well, I graduated from University of Chicago about two years ago, so I'm about 23 years old, and right now I just code websites, and I also. We're working with this startup that has like, um, act, I'm actually a co-founder. Co we have a small NSF mini grant of like two and a half K and we're about to go for the bigger grant of like 50 K. And so like, yeah, I just uh, ran into Johan in a, like a few years back. Turned out he actually grew up in the, my in my hometown. Um, but I actually ran, ran into him after watching his material and he sort of got me back into philosophy because I wasn't really thinking about it that much while I was in college. I saw his videos while I was in school, actually. Um, and uh, he sort of convinced me to, like his stuff actually convinced me to go from like the sort of materialistic uh, Platonism that I had for sort of formulated on my own um, into sort of like a Neoplatonic idealism um, but just based on like looking at like what he what his stuff was and sort of like evaluating um, evaluating like you know scientific evidence and things I had seen earlier in my physics classes and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, it, it's been it's been a ride since then. Like just running into a whole bunch of different people and uh, you know talking to different sorts of people who have various theses theses putting forward evidence um, from physics papers mostly uh, for and against various theses and that sort of thing. Um, you know, with the whole uh, realism versus uh, non-realism debate within quantum mechanics and then how that ties into your general ontology and, ph and philosophy of mind debates um, between things like idealism and, psych and psychism on the one hand and substance dualism and materialism on the other. So yeah, it's just been real, rather interesting. Yeah, yeah. By the way, I, I'm afraid uh, uh, Johanan might have nodded off on us here. No, I'm here. Oh, no. Uh, I'm here. Oh, oh, here. Okay. I, I, I heard him. I was just listening. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's not a party without you, John. 
<laughs> well, Trevor, um, yeah, the whole idea of uh, materialism versus idealism, I came to that after I watched uh, a channel called, have you ever heard of uh, Inspiring Philosophy? Yeah, I'm familiar with that, yeah. Yeah, I, now, uh, well, uh, after watching those videos, I, um, I thought that they made a few good points, and I actually started asking him questions on his uh, discussion page. And he, in a way, convinced me. I was a bit skeptical, but I thought, you know, back then I, I, I'm, I wasn't an agnostic. I, I wasn't, wasn't exactly an atheist because at one point I was thinking about becoming one because a lot of, I had so many questions and, you know, a lot of this didn't make any sense, but I couldn't accept atheism because, well, for other reasons I'll tell later on, it's just, it just didn't make any sense at that time. So I was cutting kind of in between the black and white. I was sort of a gray mixed, but, um, I even watched a few atheist videos and I thought they actually might have a good point. Um, I even been talking with some atheists. Uh, I've gone to discussions with Essence of Thoughts, anti and X and a few others. I've been in contact with Arnrar, been trying to get in contact with a few other people, but main point is that uh, when I started communicating with Mr. Manic, I thought he was a guy. Hey, Tom, you said you Boy, was I wrong. Aaron Ra. Did you still uh, what? Are you still in contact with Aaron Ra? Um, I messaged him. I don't. I don't think he ever replied to me. I, I know I, I have like to debate him sometime. He's on. He's oh. actually on reasonable reasonable faith debunked. So you might be able to catch him there. Right. Uh, hmm. Um. Yeah. It would. It would be interesting. But. But you know, and uh, of all these are atheists, I I decided that we should. Which I should just put this podcast out right now. Uh, right. Right now with. Uh, since. You know, uh, essence. Uh, no, not essence. Sorry, uh, uh, escaping atheism. He, I, I wanted to try to get in contact with him, and thought we'd just do this podcast really quick. Because uh, after I met Inspire Philosophy, I went to Johan, and then Johan and thought of making a uh, just a response. And I thought, what kind of response? And he thought, well, what if it would just be you and me? And I thought, could we add more people like a podcast? And he thought, yes, let's do a podcast. And this is how we came to conclude with it. Too bad uh, escaping atheism. He was. You know, he was too busy. Like deflating atheism, uh, he was too busy. Was he? Was he? That's what I'm guessing, right? Uh, yeah. Well, no. He had. He was going to do a hangout on Sunday. I have no idea what he's doing tonight. But yeah, he was oh. not available on Sunday. Right. Well, he he can come whenever he wants to. The more the merrier, I say. Um. So basically, from what I understand, I put this together. Um. Johan, did you want to do? Uh, I got the videos right here. The videos on abortion. The messianic manic made right the uh yeah the, all right then i uh i watched those as well too back then but uh when i found my philosophy's video on abortion i actually thought he might have a few good points and there was a time where my son Mac, i was trying to get in contact with him he wouldn't spy, respond back to me so i thought of just telling him that i'm just a theist now sorry about that because i actually thought i had a connection with him back then i actually thought he was a really smart guy and boy was i wrong <laughs> like holy shit what the hell was i thinking just, I, I, i'm sorry I, I shouldn't say that i i want to respect this guy as much as i can I, I really do i it's just that when i watched his abortion videos again it was like i was opening my eyes i saw it and i was like wow this is really 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 bad just uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've certainly done my responses, and I'll, I'll eventually get a, get around to doing another response to TMM on some of his, uh, on some of his uh, you know, uh, atheism videos. But yeah, uh, he'll, he'll, he'll pull some stuff out of his back pocket that's just astoundingly stupid, and his little uh, peanut gallery will just commend him all the same. Oh, yeah, it, it's so <laughs> ridiculous. It's like, it's a, I mean, you look at some of these, some of these videos are just stupid. Stupid, and yeah. the ridiculous thing about it is, is I mean, sometimes it's hilarious. Like, there's literally, you'll get like hundreds of likes before it even gets a, a thumb down. And it's literally like these people are robotic. Like, there's this horde well, of yeah, robotic people. Audience. Like, like who, like, like you know, who do you think is watching this? Honestly, do you think that the people who are watching these things are people who really engage with any of these topics on a serious level? Um, do you think that that many of them 
have even basic formal training in things like logic or epistemology? No, of course not. Like a lot of these people are, you know, maybe they attended a little, little bit of college. Maybe they're still in middle school or high school or something. You know, these are your fedora atheists. Who and what, I, what I find to be so funny <laughs> is that so many of them think they're so smart, except that like, I mean, when, when the whole, you know, atheism thing started out, you'd have some smart atheists. Yeah. But now it looks like literally there are like numb nuts kids out there. <laughs> and, and well, I mean, and, 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 they I, think they're smart fair. because they're atheists, right? Well, that that's that's the whole thing is that it, it, it's it's become a system of providing validation for people who can't get validation any other way. So yeah, you get the dimwits who, if they're part of this community, that will reassure them that they are the intellectual elite. They want to be part of that community. So now they have a perfect system for attracting dimwits. You know? Oh yeah, yeah. they just it's it's. I mean, you see, kind of like the, the stupid comments. It's just. <laughs> Yeah, I guess. Well, I mean, not. like, it's not even. It's not even just that. I mean, like, if if you've seen messianic manic stuff, it's like, I remember this one video. He, what he went to explain basically what he called his version of neutral monism, and it was basically just physicalism rehashed, and just slapping on the term neutral monism as though it, as though it were cool. Like he literally said that he didn't think that there was anything else aside from the physical to say that something exists is physical is to say it exists yeah. it was tautological that it's physical and then he didn't think that there was really anything intrinsic in, that there was really anything mental and he thought that mental was just like a name of like arrangements of the physical or something like that and so we're, we're getting we're getting away it was from really the... reductive physicalism it was yes. really reductive physicalism yet he called it neutral monism and he got a lot of likes for it yeah, well, right. we're, we're getting away from the topic of, of, of abortion, but in, in my responses to him, he actually uh, said that he does not believe in mind-independent truth. So there goes logic. There goes any possibility of argumentation. <laughs> he doesn't believe in mind-independent truth. And every, every, all, all the bad crap. boys were like, all right, you, know, you, should, you wrecked uh, deflating atheism. <laughs> It was all right. Crazy. Yeah, dude, just just straight up go to Rida on us. Man. That's, <sighs> yeah. that's it. <laughs> By the but, way, Tra Trevor, can you uh, get a little closer to your microphone? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was yeah, gonna yeah. say, yeah, um, so we can hear you better. Yeah. By the way, okay. Um, okay. I was wondering, is it pronounced? Uh, I heard people told me his name is pronounced differently, but I could be wrong. I I've been calling him Messianic or Manic, Derrida but or Derrida. I've heard both really. I'm like, not sure if it's Derrida or Derrida. I I heard like some people call him Messianic maniac, and I was thinking that oh, would oh, suit him. It's manic. It's just manic. It's, it's manic. manic yeah. But ma Bruh, maniac is like his nickname because you know he is a maniac. So yeah, I was gonna say that's why I'm leading <laughs> to. He should go with that. He is literally a maniac. And after we get done with his abortion videos, well, I mean, well, uh, let, let's get started, shall we? Yeah. There are some other people I want to pwn in the future. Uh, there is this thing by anti citizen XSL on quantum idealism. And he was making some oh, comments no. in there about how, like, quantum mechanics is done with the epistemology of positivism. And so, obviously, this is stupid because you're, you're not doing it with the right epistemology. Like, no, that's the problem, moron. Positivism is a bunch of crap, okay? It's not, it's not, it's incoherent in garbage. You have a century right. in yeah, it, it, so no yeah. wonder, I mean, and then this is an attitude I've seen in the physics community because, I mean, they don't. They're not like they're saying I adopt positivism. What they're saying is, functionally speaking, that's how they do physics, right? Because I mean, they just you know they're not paying attention to any of the philosophical inf implications of it at all. They're just like kind of doing this stupid, like mindless shut up and calculate approach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, exactly. they'll yeah. look at you hey, through you, you would what bring in like what it means. Like it's, I mean, like you, you, yeah. you know, the fact that space is emergent, and you can know that space is emergent from. Even John Carroll is saying space is emergent from quantum mechanics alone, not just quantum gravity, and it's very obviously so. Yeah, well, and Sean Carroll is an atheist too, isn't he? Yeah, but the thing is, if space is emergent, you know, it's... Well, there goes all materialism and physicalism. There goes physicalism. You can't have... It, it's not even... It doesn't make a short... And okay, Let me show you how bad this is, okay? Um, space time. Off topic from the... the by the by the way, while you're while you're uh, uh, getting that, I just want to make a point that every 
the new atheists think they're they're blazing a path to the future, but every idea they have is firmly rooted in the 19th century, whether it's positivism yeah. or, or verificationism or Jesus okay. or the. Let me show you something hilarious yeah, here. Okay, there is, is like 18th century. Was it 19th century? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, at the latest. Yeah, right, uh, go on, John. Let me see if I can screenshot this here. This is actually a really hilarious example of this, okay? All right, then. And well, this well. is, you know, this, this is just par for the course in the physics community, okay? All right. This kind of thing is, it's insanely stupid, but it's like, you see it and you're like, what in the world are you thinking? Well, while, while you're doing that, uh, I want to mention that I've been in long discussions with anti X and... I just think he's probably one of the worst out there. I he, you cannot reason with this guy, especially when I was trying to understand if free will existed or not. And every time I would try to bring it up to about free will, and I was thinking, well, does it exist or not? He would always say, for the last time, Tom, what is free will? And oh he, yeah, he'll, he'll just he'll just feel like this like absurd level of skepticism about everything. He he also yeah. mentioned that. He doesn't care how much evidence there is for free will. If you cannot demonstrate it, it doesn't exist. And I'm thinking that's like anti-science right there. I mean... Well, he, to him, if it demonstrate, he only will accept anything that is empirical. Like, it's just stupid. Right, right. He, he wants to... Not even that. to point out that you need certain things to ground empiricism in the first place, you know? Like, you can't have knowledge without... I mean, like, at least in that, I pointed out in that, that foundationalist argument video that you need a form of objective idealism to even connect your senses to the outside world. And right. you can't so, connect well, your senses to the outside world. Not far, but just like, you know. Well, it's because it's, it's of the whole, you know, you start with your senses and they have to reach some kind of set of logical steps from your senses to the outside world. And when you have, you know, when you start with your premises, the, the terms in the premises have to show up in the conclusion. So if your premises are your sensory data, whatever is beyond your sensory data that you're, you're interacting with, that your senses are sensing has to be come in the same terms as that. Okay. And so because of that, like Hoffman, I'm not me certain about all of the details of Hoffman's conscious realism, but like the approach he's using, the epistemology he's using something that like that is going to have to be correct automatically. If there is going to be such a thing as science, you okay, can't, yeah. you can't get to the outside world otherwise. Right. I oh yeah. I, that, that's that, that I agree with, but I, I was thinking you were going to talk, talk more about um, sort of, the necessity of universals of like sort of like a realism instead of a nominalism just to sort of know anything really to, to know that to, not, to know that knowledge even exists requires sort of this universal of oh that like, too yeah that's obvious that, so that, this the, is the, word knowledge the one i was giving was even more not. practical than that it was yeah. like you actually need this if you're going to say that you're you're not just going to be stuck in an epistemic solipsism you know yeah that, that's what you want to get past if you want to say that there is an external world you're interacting with, you need this objective idealism. Otherwise, you you can't. You're stuck in you know Kant's transcendental idealism land. Yeah, you can't. You can't really. You can't really say anything about the actual world if you don't have some sort of bridge between your senses and it directly. Which mm -hmm. means that it would have to have the same um, terms. Ecology. Yeah. I, I would like to say something uh, really quick. <laughs> okay. Here. Oh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Um. I got the page you, you have right here. Uh, yeah, so. Okay, now watch see. this. Guys, look at this, okay? Look at the title of the thing, okay? Do you ever see that Hang link? On, um, yeah, I have the link right here, yeah. I'd love to. Can you find some way to, like, put that up on the page? I tried to screenshot it, but I don't know where to put the screenshot in. Wait, is there any way to, like, I could see this in the Hangout, or, like, is, anyone, uh, is everyone else seeing this right now, or? Am this I is my. Only... This is like my first time doing this no, here. I'm not seeing yeah. anything. I'm not seeing anything. Oh, but wait, I'm, yeah. seeing, I'm seeing something now. Uh, okay, oh, here yeah, it is. Yeah. With, uh, okay. Uh, okay. There we go. Put it. Put it back up. Put it back yeah. up. What would you just do? Put it back up, Tom. Yeah. Put it up and mute your microphone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Now check this out, guys. Look at the title of the uh, article. It says, "Does so space some emerge from quantum information?" Right. You don't get any more idea. Go up. Go up. You miss, uh, something I want to show up. Go. Okay. This is this is a perfect example of this kind of stupidity. Okay. I showed this to Moreland, and he pointed out, you know, if, if what Sean Carroll is saying is true, idealism is automatically true because information is mental. He just gave the whole game away. If, you know, space time, you have space time emerging from information, it has to be idealist, right? Because information is mental. You have a whole world emerging from something that's mental. Now, even if you don't make that deduction, 
even if you don't go to idealism, the notion of reality, physical reality, a space time, coming out of information is certainly anything but materialist, right? And physicalist. It doesn't make a shred of sense to call that materialist or physicalist. Well, yeah, the, the way I'd say it is that, like, you necessarily have something that transcends the physical realm that the physical is actually based upon. Yeah, now, now, can't have I'm going to show you the stupidity of this. Go back to the, go back to the screenshot. Okay. Okay. Look up in the upper right corner of the page, a little slogan he has on the top of his blog. That one, yep. Read it. In truth, only atoms are the void. And the void. Uh, That's oh, yeah, you know, the that, slogan that, from Democritus, right? Quantum information directly contradicts that. Yeah, I mean, it's basically like... We have this advanced model of emergent space time from quantum information, and because this this proves the 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 um this is the final triumph of science in proving materialism, democracy, and he, he's great hard. He's grasping on to nineteenth century <laughs> physicalism with white knuckles, you know. Not not yeah. even like nineteenth like, 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 like century. Two things on this page like, are in complete like... contradiction from one another. Space time emerged from quantum information on the one side. And the other side, he's saying, in truth, only atoms in the void up in the court. Like, like, these two statements are as black and white night and day different from each other than you can get. They're By the way, that was a good uh, impression of anti and X. I liked it a lot. You know, the, he, he has that authoritarian voice where he would always say that, like, I know better than other people do because I <laughs> myself is smarter than everyone else. And I pull shit and bullshit out of my ass all the time. Mm -hmm. and I just... <laughs> now the thing about this is is when it comes to actual physics I would agree that Sean Carroll is smarter. I mean he has but the thing is he doesn't understand like he'll do his he's smart in terms of his calculations of his physics. I mean I use his stuff in my videos because it's so good in terms of the physics. The problem is, is he hasn't the slightest idea what the implications of this are. But the, that's the thing I've noticed that a lot of people um in the sciences mainly I would say is that there's sort of this localized rationality where they're, they'll really just reason about whatever their discipline is, but then the second that you go outside of that, they just hold on to whatever sort of worldview they started off with on every on almost everything else. So Yeah, and the thing is, is when you point stuff out, I mean, this is obvious, okay? If you told Joe down the street, your world is an information construct, okay? You know, they would, and whether or not they would believe you, they would understand that the claim that you're making is that's a matrix like claim. You know, it's like saying you're in a simulation or virtual reality, it's the world isn't real, you know, and materialism right. is false. They'll automatically understand what that means. Now, the funny thing is, is that the, the physicists who create the physics that are showing this, and they're doing a very good job showing this, they haven't the slightest, I mean, they can literally spell out idealism in the physics. I mean, you can combine, you know, Sean Carroll's ADS Mera with um, um, Dario. Uh, I think you know who Dario is. Yeah, you know who Dario is. I don't know if the other two guys know who Dario is. I kind of got him going. He's, a, he's one of a former, another, another former atheist on my page, and he came around, and he's actually loves my stuff now, and he's he's working on a upgraded form of the digital physics argument for, like, an you know, actual paper, right? Well, that sounds great, um, but... Um... <laughs> and he is, anyway, he's, he's developed, you know, he's pointing out he's combined you know, the Wheeler-DeWitt equation with um, emergent space from, from entanglement to combine it with, you know, integrated information theory to create a very mathematically rigorous scientific form of idealism, quantum idealism, right? Uh, uh, this you is can all do this. Stuff. You can do this, like, in a very, you know, mathematically rigorous sort of way that just follows out of the cognitive science as is the formalism of the cognitive scientists and the formalism of the physics, right? You put the two of them together, you get this idealism. And you just spell this right out. But the thing is, is that you'd have, you know, Tononi is a materialist because he doesn't really understand about the emergent space-time stuff. And Carol is a physicalist. But, I mean, like, literally, and, and you know, well, to his credit, Tononi is a panpsychist more now. But you combine this stuff, and you'll see it's just, it, it literally is idealism, right? And not even idealism in a philosophic sense or a metaphysical sense. It's just idealism in the sense of that's what the equations are saying. You know, you get a 
the universe is as defined by a um, the, a wave function by the, defined by the wheeler Wood equation. You can get a density matrix out there. From it, you can calculate the phi state that everything is being emergent from. Well, what is a phi state? It's consciousness in Tononi's model. So you have emergent space-time from consciousness in a mathematically scientific sort of way. Nothing to do with philosophy or metaphysics or anything. They would just take that, I'm guessing, like just do the stupid like shut up and calculate. And at the end of the paper, they would then say, in truth, only atoms in the void, right? And they would take this as evidence for democracy and materialism. <laughs> yeah. Right. It, 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 it's you know, just the way to... Despite, despite them just like deriving full-blown idealism from... Yeah. Right. If you know... And they're completely like, tone deaf to this. Totally it's ridiculous. Same thing. I mean... He said, yeah, well, we still need a being right. to dream up these equations, you know? Mm -hmm. Right now, before we get with... To start with anything else, I'm sorry, I just want to cut in this here. I want to say this final thing about Antisys and X, and I think we should get on to the abortion video really quick. Since, But sure. when I was talking to Antisys and X, he was always expecting you need some sort of physical proof, you know, for it to exist or something, you know. You know, you, if I can't see it, it doesn't exist. And I suggested, well, well, well we can't really see. There goes all mathematics and everything. Just so... Hey, there goes the wave function in quantum it's mechanics. It's yeah, there, there goes. There of course, even that's goes what they like, do. That's what they do. I mean, they, they, they've actually gotten ridiculously positive. It's, believe it or not, it is a point in content of contention in physics whether the wave function exists. Well, yeah. Well, uh, anyway. I mean, well, okay. Well, I, it, it should be obvious that there is a reason that there, are, you know, there are these quantum probabilities that exist in nature that are producing these interference patterns. It wasn't, you know, just magic that created the interference pattern in the double slit experiment. Oh yeah, There's I've been researching on that. I understand. Right, and I understand yet, that, but yet, despite that, because of their absurdly positivistic instrumentalist, uh, you know, approach, they're like just dafted in the head when it comes to yes, an actual thing in reality caused that interference pattern there. You know, that's just just a a, a instrumentalist, um, you know, approximation or a a useful fiction or something. I mean, like. Good grief. Right, uh, but, uh, right, well, as I was going on, I, no, I agree with everything you're saying right there. Uh, it's just that when I was telling him that, you know, we can't observe, like, the particles make up the atom, you know, or the quarks inside of it, but he says that since we can interact with quarks, we know it exists, you know, because we have evidence for it, at least we can understand it, he says. And, you know, if you can understand it, then, you know, then it is true. But if you can't understand something, I don't care how much evidence you have, it doesn't exist. And I said, well, we have a hard time understanding gravity. And his response by saying, oh, no, we understand gravity completely. And I'm saying, are, are you kidding me? Wow. Right are, are you insanely dense? <laughs> no, no. I'm saying, I, I, and listen, I'm not a physicist, no, yeah, no. but I know yeah. this. I mean, out of the four forces, gravity is the most mysterious of us. We have a hard we time explaining. We don't have quantum gravity yet. I know, I and I'm saying, what about gravity? And he just completely ignored it. He basically, he's basically going through an absolute skeptic, which is, you know, can easily be shown to Bill. He'll just say, you know, logic is illogical. And I'll say, you're making like a logical claim right there. He'll it's, say, it's, like, it's uh, incoherent. No, number one, it's incoherent to be yeah. that skeptical. And even in practice, like you know, when it gets into the physics, like like, see, you become, you know, a skeptic about the wave function and a skeptic about the philosophic implications of you know, the, the, the yeah, physics, like right? That. And it becomes, yeah, up. it's actually impractical at that point. His skepticism actually becomes impractical. Like, like he, he might get away from it, away with it because you can play this instrumentalist game in the physics community. And you, you know, like, cause it's, it, it, it's, I have, I mean, I don't know how, like positivism was debunked a long time ago, but it was, you know, shown to be like, it's for some reason, like, the spirit of positivism, shall we say, just kind of like zombied on in the physics and the sciences. Can, can I just ask you a quick question? Go ahead. You're using the word instrumentalism. I, I'm not quite sure what that means. Basically, it's sort of a functional positivism. It's a, it's a we don't need anything else other than um, we don't need to say that their theories are true because we only need to say they predict things. Okay, because I, I've heard atheists make this point where they're where useful I, in I predicting say, things, right? That's all they yeah. say. Like it's, it, it's, 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 it's a, it's a kind of a practical version of positivism. But what I'm saying is, is that practically this doesn't even, it, it's, it's no longer, you know, this I, kind of this kind of epistemic approach. It's, it's no longer even practical. Yeah, like, like it might be practical if you're just getting doing this, like this 
insanely retarded zombified shut up and calculate approach but anyone any joe blow on the street you know will understand you, you show them the wave function you show them like the measurement problem they'll understand the implication you show them emergent space and they'll understand the implications of this yeah, yeah. say oh well, yeah it's very obvious what's going on here i mean I'd actually literally looking at this picture I'd, I'd actually go further in saying the uh degree to which we, we are negatively affected by this sort of instrumentalism it's that it's actually it's actually hampering um theoretic theoretical innovation that could be happening um, oh because, i know well well yeah i, I mean it's, it's more than that though it's like for example you know we have these we have these ideas of like of like string theory now um and that's basically to get around the fact that um you get all you used to, you get all these singularities once you got beneath the planck's the planck scale um, and you tried to reconcile gravity with quantum mechanics. So, like, you know, your general relativity and your quantum mechanics just won't work at that level. Um, and so you have to find a way to sort of wiggle around it. And so the way that string theory handles it is that um, for string theory, it actually ends up being that the level that's beneath, the like, the Planck length actually doesn't exist. And so the reason that you don't have everything imploding into black holes or whatever is the fact is actually coming out of the fact that um, space time is just granular and that falls out as a result of string theory. Now, the thing is, string theory was sort of just a wild speculation guess, as in people were, you know, fiddling around with the mathematics and they found some of Gauss's old stuff. And um, I think it was like Susskind and a few other um, physicists who found, who sort of uh, played around with that and then realized that there, there's this other formalism that you can use to approach that. To approach problems at that level um but that was sort of trial and error the thing is um today we also have um donald hoffman and donald hoffman has this hypothesis which you know it's actually based directly on these uh well partially at least on these uh implications of physics um which you know say that the objects we see are not you know fully defined with every single trait there that we um, saw beforehand. So in other words, um, the whole idea of the objects just being there in the sort of naive sense that we think about them doesn't necessarily work with the actual math. And so that got him to thinking and he also went through a whole bunch of other um, thinking regarding you know, evolutionary models and whether or not we would see the world as it is just given evolution um, and eventually came to sort of this Kantian idealism um, where it's like, well, there's no there's no possible way that what we're seeing is actually is actually there in, in the same exact sense before we're seeing it. And then from there, he uh, was able to it was able to basically speculate further that, you know, you'd have this sort of ontological idealism. And in his case, he wanted to make it mathematically rigorous. So he came up with this consciousness realism thing. Um, in which what we see is really sort of like the uh, really the rest of representations of uh, conscious agents. Yeah, and his model, I mean, you pointed this well, out to me, Trevor, his model is actually more powerful in terms of explaining things that are just taken as givens, you know, without explanation, like, yeah, like how yeah, spin works I mean, and, and so on. Yeah, and, and that's actually what right. I wanted to yeah. get to is that um, this, this actually, this was actually just speculative theoretical power of um thinking just like combining philosophy and what he did was he took these conscious agents put them through psychological game theory and he found he can explain the placebo effect better can't well, he well, well i mean then... it's more than that though let me let me just try to finish because it's actually important it's actually way more important than that um, okay continue he actually found he actually found that the group for um quantum field theory was actually one of the groups that you get just from having two of these agents interact on, on, on their own. So he was able to derive a lot of quantum field theory as well as uh, quantized, uh, quantized general, sorry, a quantized sort of like a Minkowski space for, um, for relativistic quantum mechanics. And he was able to, to derive a lot of that off the bat using just using philosophical ideas. And the thing, and the thing is right now, physics is so divorced from philosophy that you really need an outsider um, like, like, you know, Hoffman's a guy who uh, he, he's, he's friends with physicists, but he's, he himself is actually 
Uh, I hate to interrupt. I could, could you wrap this up? I'm I'm sorry. It's just uh, I want to get on to this other video thing. We've been talking about quantum mechanics for like 30 minutes. Um, I know. I was like, I was like is, this is only on my kind of hangout where you end up talking about quantum mechanics, idealism, and abortion all in the same hangout. Well, Trevor, I, um, I'll, I'll just like, I'll try to finish like, like 15 seconds. Basically, what we have is a potential for real life predictions, theoretical predictions about quantum mechanics that come from this philosophical insight. But the problem is that it's so hampered. The, They're within, so within, hampered. Much of the, within much of the physics community, you just aren't allowed to use philosophy that way. And so this sort of insight, these sorts of insights have actually been prevented by this philosophical in, use of instrumentalism. And that's all I had to say about that. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's like it, it's 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 literally zombified thinking. Like right, they're okay. what they do within their framework, but they're so they're so stultified they can't even see, you know, the obvious. You know, Joe on the street, you tell them the physics is saying okay. it's like, oh, obviously that's what this is. Okay, yeah, right. I think John, and that's why. That's right. by the way, that's why I've been promoting this the way I have. On, I mean, I saw this. I mean, you know, because I, I, I was. I didn't do physics by itself. I did I did philosophy for fun because I was kind of like in high school I like philosophy. So I did the philosophy minor with my physics and I'm like, oh, it's obvious. I mean, I, I knew that there's, there are links between these two things way back. And I get into the physics, you know, department and I'm like, this is peculiar. No one is even thinking about this. They're just like dafted. And okay, John, uh, I'm I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to stop you right there. I, I don't want to okay. cut you off, but if we let's have time go to abortion. After. Yeah, if we have time after this, we can go back to quantum mechanics and antis is the next. Let's go. Stuff. Let's go to abortion. Let's go to abortion. Yeah, we've been okay. wasting time on that. I, no, only one of my hangouts for something ridiculous like this happened. I know, right. it sounds like fun. Let, let's let's talk about abortion. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Bring up the bring up the the screenshot with the abortion uh, thing. Okay, then. Got right here. Uh, okay, so I made this comment right where I said he was complaining that. Uh, forcing someone to give uh, birth to a, a baby was cruel and unusual punishment, and I was kind of angry about this. And I'm like, well, <laughs> but that's what they deserve, <laughs> you know? Like, like they're going to kill a baby, yeah. you know, chop a baby apart. That's what they deserve, you know. And it's like, well, what about the Eighth Amendment? That that they, you know, like then I made this comment that's kind of like you know, smart alecky and kind of like authoritarian, just for I want just to throw a bomb in there, basically. I said. Well, um, the founders made it. They have some quotes making it very clear that, um, uh, you know, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, they only apply to or they only work for a moral people. When the people are, are you know, they, they become less moral, then you need a more authoritarian form of government to um, to control them and so on. Of course, this is going to irritate the heck out of him because he's a moral relativist. But yeah. But and then we're, he, we're assured life, liber, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Okay. We're, not, we're not guaranteed a pain-free existence. But the point is, is he then became like he brought he brought attention to this in his video. He became all appalled about, and and Johanan thinks that authoritarianism and cruel and unusual punishment are okay. That's the value set he's coming from, right? I'm like, you know, I, I'm trying to like just irritate them, and they they, they, they he reacts like this, right? But the point is, is Go back to that screenshot you showed me, because this is okay, very. I just want to like, pa like pause and like look at the title. It says, um, "Is a fetus human?" And that's just, well, you know, that's an unscientific. That's an unscientific sort of thing. If you're trying to question that, um, whether or not a fetus is a human being, that's it, every it's medical human. textbook even, ever even if you were said that. About, even if you were talking about a skin cell, a skin cell, a skin this right cell here, cell yeah, human would yeah. be human. So this, this is a, this is a stupid question to begin with. I right, go back to the screenshot though. All or right, you, uh, show me the show me what he said. Okay, then this right here. He uh, okay. Yeah. My position isn't based on argument at all. It's based on my conscience. The whole point I'm making is that is it. Um, Still, my oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Go, on. go back. Go back. Go back. Free. Here, uh, I, I, listen. I, I'm not that good at reading, but I'll try my best. Uh, my position isn't based on an argument at all. It's based on my consciousness. The whole point I'm making in this video is that my position is one that I cannot help but hold. I'm not saying that it uh, that makes it right. I'm saying that it will be the position I hold regardless of whatever it is or it is not right. Wait, hold on. Didn't you? There was another one you had about how he said that even. Um, oh yes, I'll get. Before. I'll get to that. That's I, I the found one I'm looking comments. for. That's the one I'm looking for. 
Right. Not I found these yet. comments right here, but uh, I want to go over this, like how messed up this is. So even if it's not right, he won't change his position. Just, wow. Yeah. He's, exp he's saying that openly. So you yeah, and that's that. the thing, you know. He, because he doesn't he believe in objective morality. He has a video saying he doesn't actually believe in objective morality. So, of course, he's not going to believe oh, it. Oh, so, go back to so, that comment, though. Okay. okay now this is interesting here. Um, okay. Hypothetically, what if there were some freak discovery tomorrow that proved to us that fetuses are perfectly aware of all the pain and abortions cause them incredible suffering? Uh, that's not even a freak discovery. That's actually, like, science. I mean, they... they yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's science that shows they, they, that. I have looked this up myself. The yeah. capacity to, I forget what the link was, but like by 12 weeks, they're able to like sense pain, you know? You know, that's, you know, just the end of the first trimester, at least, you know? And so now, th that wouldn't change my position. I'd still rather be one of those fetuses rather than someone forced to give birth. Now, in this context, he's, in the video, he was talking about the sort of Rawlsian, um, you know, original position where you, you put yourself into this position, like, it's like a, Basically, you put everyone involved into a a blind situation where they have to pick out of a hat of what person they might end up being, right? You know, uh, uh, a baby that's going to get aborted, a mother, you know, et cetera, that needs to abort, et cetera. And so everyone has an equal chance of being aborted or aborting, right? And ironically, when this same exact thing came up in philo um, political philosophy class way back, I was like, you know, this is... I think most people would think that if there was a chance they'd be aborted, you know, to say we had this weird situation where anyone could be aborted, right? Um, like, what was the name of that movie? Uh, the one that just came out, not just came out, like last year it came out on the whole um, The Purge. Yeah, I was going to say The Purge. Like, like so imagine we had a society where there was The Purge and anyone had a chance of being quote unquote aborted, right? No one would be for abortion. If, if something like the purge was legal and there is one day a year where anyone would go out and kill anyone else and it would be perfectly legal, no one would be for that because they'd all have a chance of getting killed, you know? And right, what's uh, ironic is it's just obvious. I mean, like, who in their right mind would value the ability to get an abortion versus the possibility of being aborted like, over, over that? Like, no one would... He apparently takes just, I mean, basically, it just boils down to a random, I mean, kind of, he's telling the truth here back there, but he basically boils down to a random, you know, choice on his part to, to adopt abortion. Uh, it's not an argument, it's a, it's a sentiment, It's his basically. own opinion, basically. It's his yeah, own opinion, and there's yeah, not even an just, argument behind yeah, his opinion. It's, 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 it's just a sentiment. He wants, basically, yeah. he just feels this way, therefore, he, this is how he's going to behave. Okay, go back to that, go back to the thing, though. I'll but now... Say, well, the thing is, I'll actually laud him on this part because this is actually cons a consistent. This is like the most consistent I I've actually seen him with his with his sort of philosophical positions. Um, that you know he's really standing by his sort of version of uh, either relativism or subjectivism, uh, where he's just like, well, I just hold my disposition, and that's my disposition. I don't care either way. I'm just gonna stick by it. You know, I I can sort of respect that coming out of him but then once he starts trying to go to these sorts of scientific arguments or whatnot and uh just basically denying science then that's you know that that's that, that's uncalled for yeah yeah he he's basically acting like a fundamentalist right now i mean that's yeah that's the one thing i found with atheists and fundamentalists they have a lot in common they both reject uh -huh. science <laughs> now now okay okay here's the other thing though the other thing i wanted to point out here is remember what he said about complaining and he balking at my my you know attempt to lob a Molotov cocktail in the discussion session and be like, well they deserve to live in an authoritarian society where they can be cruelly unusually punished type of thing you know, um, he's in favor of cruel and unusual punishment here. He's saying so explicitly. Like hypothetically, what if there was some freak discovery? Was well, not even a freak discovery. It, it, that's just science. Um, go back. Uh, yeah, it's right it? here. I got right here. I'll read it myself. Uh, all right. Uh, let's see here. Is it right here? Oh wait, maybe this is this. Uh, let's go back up really quick. Okay, uh, go go go. Oh, go, here. Go, go, no, go back. Go back. Go back down. Okay, that one too. Okay, but both of them. I see. We stop there, but well, then go on. down after. Ignore. 
I'll, I'll read this really quick. He's saying, okay. hypothetically, what if there was some freak discovery tomorrow that proved to us that fetuses are perfectly aware of all pain and abortions caused them incredible suffering? And his response was, that wouldn't change my position. I would still rather be one of those fetuses than be someone forced to give birth. Yeah, I bet he's saying that. That's, because he's no, just saying that outright. He's saying he's, I, I if think he's abortion probably just was proven to there. be cruel and unusual punishment, I would still be in favor of it. Well, I, I yeah, think that, he's that, literally that. just biting the bullet. So there. he's – yeah, I know, but the point is is that, that that's, that's a straight-up hypocritical. Like he's complaining – if he's going to do – if he's going to bite the bullet like that, he should not then go around and complain about me being for cruel and unusual punishment. Can, can that, I, that, I think it's consistent, but he's a but you have to remember he's a relativist, and so like he doesn't think that there that there's um you know an actual morality out there. So you know it's perfectly fine for him under his system, under his ethical system to just he can be pick stuff at random. Him. Well, there's a problem with that, and it's kind of ironic because he said this one video on um moral objectivism and um authoritarianism. And it, while it is true that you can have authoritarianism under either system, whether it be relativism or, I mean, you can have a perfectly valid um, basis for authoritarianism on a subject of morality. Mm -hmm. You know, when you go beyond good and evil, and you realize that uh, there are some people that are fitting to be ruled yeah. those with slave morality, and then there's the uber mansion top, you know. I can point to him right now, a, a perfectly, um, perfectly more is a total moral relativist, okay, who believes that uh, you know there should be I think authoritarianism be moral nihilist in this sense, in this case. Yeah, yeah. Well, what's he going to say when Emperor Palpatine says, "Good is a point of view," Anakin? Yeah, yeah. Like he's, he has no defense against this at all. Yeah. Like, but he's just I, I mean, like it's 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 what what's the point? Like it's it's. It, it's only by he has no reason he literally destroyed any of his bases for objecting to anything. Yeah, and he's hypocritical when it comes to, you know, he is saying if abortion was found to be cruel and unusual punishment, he would be for it anyway. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. It's uh, and isn't that his point where he believes in subjective morality? Basically, if a group of people, you know, don't think it's wrong, it's not wrong. I mean, what would happen if everyone decided murder isn't wrong? You know, what would happen? What's what would wrong with shutting down the democracy? If I don't like the democracy and it's my relative point of view to abort the democracy, uh, who are they to impose their morality on me? Yeah. Well, yeah, Why can't like, I abort the democracy? Yeah, it feels it's like it's based on his opinion and not on like actual reason, you know, and virtues. Mm -hmm. that... well, well, the thing is, this actually gets into politics, especially leftist politics, identity politics um, with Foucault. Um, so like Foucault so it's sort of like uh, he's, he didn't want to classify himself as like a postmodernist or a post-structuralist, but that's where a lot of scholars classify him. Um, and he was heavily influenced by Nietzsche, but Foucault's position was more or less that, you know, there isn't really an objective morality or anything, but, you know, th there are these cultural groups that have their opinions and their positions, and they can be, they, they can be uh, subject to, um, to sort of, to sort of uh, being oppressed or, you know, harmed by an, a, another group yeah and so his idea was sort of like you know maybe what maybe instead of like you know trying to go use uh these sorts of ideas of um you know abstract ideals of ethics or virtues or whatnot um instead of all of that let, let's try to let's try to figure out for a specific group what benefits us as a group and try to just implement that in, into policy and so that's where you really get your leftist ID, identity politics from. And a lot of feminists have actually been, you know, heavily inspired by that. And I suppose that also, you know, that feeds into an extent into like this whole, this whole idea of, well, abortion is fine because, you know, it's, it's the woman's body, it's her choice, all of that stuff, you know. Um, Couldn't you use that identity like, politics you know, on behalf of... And this abortion because... Um, for for us for us feminists or us women who are not thinking, who, who do not want to start families or anything like that, or that whole sort of Marxian style thinking, though, it the kind of Marxian style thinking can be used here anyhow. in any way. There's no, well, no it isn't. justification yeah. for that kind of subjective morality. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, any which any which way you look at it. What I'm getting at though is if you're gonna if you're gonna try and like you know argue for the protection of the little guy, like you know like a a kind of moral relativism where it's 
where where the underdog is always the one that is um you know well yeah that's inconsistent there's no sort supported of well foundation. who's the biggest underdog in that case except baby i mean you know right and also yeah, the like, like, the baby can't yeah. um have have a voice because the baby doesn't have enough power to say anything it's very clear the mother there. is the oppressor in that case you know yes. And, uh, it, it, and here's uh, something else he says right here. I'll read this. Uh, so regardless of how much suffering or awareness of it the fetus had, your conscience would still say it was worse for the woman to give birth. And his response was, I would rather experience the short-term suffering of the fetus than the prob – oh, sorry, prob uh, – prob uh, 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 sorry. Uh, the permanent suffering of the person forced to give birth. Yeah, yeah. How is it permanent the suffering? permanent suffering for the person to force to give birth, even if the suffering of the fetus was more in, in, intense. So, in other words, permanent suffering. That, How? Giving, that raising a child is so bad, such a negative yes! thing. Yeah. And, for, and you can even yeah. use adoption for crying out loud. I mean, what seriously? A, this is what I was trying to say before is, is what a, a dismal, cynical, miserable view of biology of motherhood, of childbirth, of human biology these people have. And mm -hmm. the, great, the great irony of it all is that it seems to be materialists who, who have the most cynical view of our own bodies. It seems mm -hmm. to be that people who affirm the existence of a creator or something have a much more sanguine understanding of, of the mind's relation to the body. In their view, it seems that the, the body is almost the enemy of the mind that we are prisoners of our own biology, and that even mere childbirth is, is like hellish punishment. Now, you talk, about, you talk about Joe Blow, go down to the uh, lady pushing a baby stroller at the end of your street. T tell her about this viewpoint, that motherhood is punishment. It's a hellish punishment. Tell me what she'll say to you. you know? Right, well, I think what Mr. Mac is saying that if it's, He's calling it punishment because if the woman doesn't want to, like if it's a mother who wants a child, that's one well, thing. Well, then they give the baby for adoption. Well, that's true. I mean, they you know, might say that it's going to be psychologically bad because you think about, you know, people say about how you give the baby for adoption that, you know, you're thinking like, oh, I, I'm a terrible mother. I abandoned my child to the world, etc. But the thing of it is, is, I mean, what's worse? Like, what would be weighing more in your conscience of, I abandoned my child in the role to a, you know, possibly a, a good family that's going to like love them and, and care for them. Or I murdered my child in a well, brutal well, well, that's chainsaw thing. massacre that's sort of way. Like, there, there are women, there are lots of women out there who, um, you know, get abortions and then they just don't feel anything. And I, I've read blog, I've read blogs about this really blog posts about, about this. A lot of women today, they don't really care about it. So it's like they, they kill their baby and they're just like, eh, and, you know, sometimes they, they, they expected that they would, you know, feel something. Um, and then they, they're sort of, they may even feel guilt about not feeling guilt, ironically. They might be like, well, I, dang, dang, I must be a psychopath or something. Um, and, you know, uh, honest, yeah. That's really sort of what, what it is. That, you know, when you're like that, you just, you just kill your own child and, you know, you don't feel any remorse. That, I, that, is, sort of, that is psychopathic. Um, well, but, I, I, would, I would suggest, yeah. you said nowadays, I would suggest that's less so the case these days than it might have been in times past, now that we, we have all this ultrasound, ultrasound technology, and even just the phrase, uh, unborn child, has become part of the uh, common parlance, and, and we talk about carrying... Well, it, was a, it, was a common, it was a part of the common parlance before the term fetus ever became yeah, predominant. Yeah, more so nowadays, would you not agree? Probably, yeah. I mean, it's with ultrasounds and, you know, yeah. MRIs well, I mean, it's and so like, on. Even, I mean, like, you know, like, the whole thing for the ultrasound is they're supposed to wa watch the ultrasound and then realize that it's their baby and, you know, feel something for the baby. And then, you know, with that empathy, maybe, just maybe, with the little bit of conscience in their heart, they won't kill their, their own child. But what we, what we now, what we see is you know, there are a lot of women who just aren't affected by that. There are a lot of women who will see the, their, the, the, the dismembered body parts of their baby and they just won't feel anything. You know, they, they, they just they just see it and they're just like, oh, well, it's whatever. And that's the part of the culture that we're in now. I remember uh, David, Dr. David Bentley Hart, 
um, Orthodox uh, theologian, uh, these professors somewhere, I'm not sure where exactly, um, mentioned that there was actually, a little while back, there was actually um, a case where there were, um, I believe it was three college-age men, and one of one of them decided one of them wanted to kill himself, and the others two were were there, and they just let him do it. And they were like, "Well, that's that's his choice. Like our, our friend wants to kill himself, and you know if, if, if he wants it, then that's fine. Just let him do it." And that's no, no, that's terrible. I mean, that's why there's, I mean, that's why there's like a suicide hotline. You're, you're supposed to call if you're going to risk killing yourself. I mean, killing yourself is a terrible thing to do. I mean, that's just wow. Yeah, it's 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 more of our um, condition, our condition of uh, modernity, as being nihilistic, in a sense, just people not realizing. Um, that there is a good life to live at all, not knowing what that means, well, not even knowing what that means. And often within, uh, I mean, e I'd say even in Christian circles, honestly, you know, a lot of people don't know what good means. So they might think that good just means what, whatever the heck God's, whatever the heck God wants them to do. Um, and so, you know, they, 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 they'll really go in, they'll really go in and approach the Bible that, that way. And very often, but very often they'll they might they might end up interpreting things in a way that you know is less generous, not exactly what you know the way it was originally interpreted or whatever, and they'll go in brashly, and they won't listen to their conscience or anything like that, and then they can end up doing things bad things. You know that's how you get extremists um, within on, within the religious side who would say, um, for example, like those sort of like gay conversion. Uh, those sort of like gay conversion camps that that aren't that that aren't voluntary, the ones that are actually forced, because you know right, okay, I go up, yeah, like uh, you know you get, you, uh, get, you get sort of child abuse cases, you get child abuse cases and whatnot over there. Um, I understand completely. People, I it's people. I, I'm taking, sorry, I'm not. People, yeah, it's people taking this idea. Um, they don't really know what good means, so they so they think that good means whatever, 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 whatever it seems that God's telling them uh, is, is it. So. Hey, hey, um, I'm trying to I'm trying to get these gay people to stop being gay. Um, so, you know, if I have to abuse them, then that's good. But, you know, what ends up happening is the other faculties that they, that we have, our reason, our empathy, all that gets ignored, and they end up doing these these terrible things. Yeah. And 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 you know, honestly, yeah. like yeah, the, yeah. The, the right. Vibe behind it is good. Good. That's you know, they're trying to help people. Um, reorient themselves, um, but you know people don't want to be reoriented. But that's already a problem on their on the other person's end. Um, but the thing is, because they don't understand um, what it means to be a good person to begin with, what it means to live the good life, um, you know, sort of like that uh, that human that human fulfillment sort of aspect of the of the good of, of the good. Yeah, they, they think that good is merely like an arbitrary edict of God rather than an, ex an expression of God's nature. Yeah, they think good and evil are like concepts. They're not physical. You can't actually touch them. Mm -hmm. You know, that's... Yeah. Anyways, let's... Uh, well, that's let, part of another let's thing. Uh, here. The whole notion of good, like, I kind of understand why that would happen. And it, okay. it comes to a metaphysical misunderstanding of the nature of God. And, I mean... It's kind of ironic because I, I mean, some of you guys have known that I've kind of been struggling with an issue for the past year or so where I, I've got this idea that God is like, and it's not like, I mean, mentally, philosophically, I can derive an argument for God is good, right? I mean, you see me do it, my provincial bony video, but I've had this problem on and off where I've, you know, questioned, was God really mean good in the sense that I mean good? And like, is he really like this sort of Lovecraftian alien trying to, you know, put the stuff on us, you know? And, uh, and, and, and I, I end up blowing up a God and getting angry and all that and so on. And well, it's actually right. kind of funny because yeah. everyone's like sees me as this big Christian apologist. And yet, you know, in my private life, I have, <laughs> I get mad at well, God. Yeah, sort of miso oh, okay. I, but, I'm sorry, guys. Yeah. I don't, I don't mean to be yeah. rude, but I think yeah, we let's get back to the on. video. <laughs> Anyway, yeah. I wanted to make this quick comment, though, that if people understood why God is good in a philosophic sense, it, it, it gets rid of this sort of boneheaded um, divine command thing where it's just like, you know, 
God said X, therefore it is what, even if it's like some horrible thing, you know, is there like, no, no, it doesn't like the reason God is good is God contains everything and God's mind contains everything else. Okay. So God's mind contains all the value sets, right? So therefore, if we have value sets, that means that they have to have originated from God's sense of value. And okay, so you. everyone's values can yeah. only ever be, if there is some value set that's a quote unquote opposed to God, it's not really that it's opposed to God. It's just that it's valuing the right thing in the wrong order. It's distorted. Right. So, I, 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 I've studied that before. Yeah. I Universally I... intersubjective point of view that God has. And so if everyone could have God's frame of reference on value, everyone would agree with it because it would actually, it would just so happen to coincide with agreeing with their senses of value. Right. Um, and anyways, I, I don't want to make oh, this I'm podcast too long. This. Okay. But well, we can talk about that nerd day though. If we have like a podcast on quantum mechanics, yeah. we'll definitely talk about that. But or we can talk just like, well, there's no uh, idealist philosophy there. But like, you can you can. Yeah, no, yeah. I'm not to be rude. I'm just want to go on. I'll I'll read yep. this last comment here. And uh, now, what was said to Messianic Manic that you're honestly saying that you would rather be the woman who inflicts incredible suffering than a woman who gives birth. And not only would I prefer to be the woman who inflicts in the suffering, I would rather be the fetus who's. Ex Exposing that suffering, then be the woman. Oh, experiencing that suffering, then be the woman who is forcing to give birth. And you know, he's just saying that because there's no way for him to go back to being a fetus. If there was a way, I'm sure he wouldn't be saying that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, like, yeah. Okay, here, 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 give him an example. Okay, I know exactly. Go back to that screenshot. I know exactly how to smoke him out on that. Okay, yeah. Um, here it is, right here. Okay, yeah. Uh, as long as you All guys right. don't talk, you yeah. Let's uh, pretend sorry. that yeah. I was. Uh, emperor of America, okay, or, or Donald Trump is he's the quote unquote a god emperor, right? Ha -ha. Donald Trump, Donald yeah, <laughs> and he wants to punish women for abortion, okay? But isn't he no, against abortion? Point. What? But isn't he against abortion? Yeah, he says he wants to punish women for abortion. Trump does. Oh, right. okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. That, that totally kind of ticked off people when I put that in my video, but uh, anyway, um, so let's suppose that Donald Trump gave. He was going to get rid of abortion, but he had one condition, okay? He had, like, a way to possibly give the pro-choice people what they want, okay? And his, his condition was he called the messianic manic up on the phone and says, um, would you be willing to come over here and be uh, – I, I, will, I will keep abortion legal under the condition that you come to the White House and be dismembered live. We have someone with a chainsaw, and they're going to cut you apart. You know, and, and kill you with a chainsaw, okay? Just like you yeah, do an well. abortion, right? Okay, and uh, and if you do that, then I will keep abortion legal. <laughs> yeah, I don't think he'll do that. I he'll, don't think he's going to yeah, do that in a heartbeat. Think, yeah. So, he'll so pull you know, something let's put him out right of that. back in the situation where he can get "quote unquote" aborted in the same way that a fetal child would get aborted, okay? Right. Uh, he's let's not going to go for that in a heartbeat. Oh. He's going to run away from that. I mean, and it's obvious right. why he. The only reason here is exactly what you said is, you know, he doesn't have to go back to being a fetus. So therefore, right, he doesn't yeah, have exactly. to be aborted. Yeah, basically everything he's saying right now, you know, even if it's wrong, I still can't change my position. He's basically saying even if it caused suffering and pain, I still would go with it. He's basically admitting murder right okay. now. So and now I'm the surprised question I have is, the question I have is, if this is the case, okay, yeah, and he doesn't actually have like logical reasons, right? I mean, you know, I'm going to presume he's not here, so I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I'm going to presume if Trump gave him that ultimatum, there's no way on earth he was going to do that, right? No, no. Okay, so obviously... He would say it would be a violation of his human rights because he's no longer... Oh, it would be, but the point is, is well, if it's a violation of his human rights, then why wouldn't it be a violation of the fetal child's human rights? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know, and we're going to so go over the that. Is, the point is here is that his logic does not make sense even from its own, from within its own framework. Yeah, that's true. I mean, So yeah, that I, means that he must have some psychological motivators for being for abortion. Yeah, he just wants to do whatever he wants, like every damn atheist. Why? They, what, what would those psychological motivators be? Well, he's not a woman, though, so why well, would he's he need a woman. to... So I'm thinking the psychological motivator here is that he'd rather be... Um, free from having, you know, potential mess ups with, if he, with a one night stand. Oh, that's what's going on. 
Yeah, yeah, I've noticed this with atheists. Like, they argue there is no morality, there's no free will. Most of them say that. I'm thinking it's basically they're arguing for no responsibility. That's so what has to lead. What he's to. doing here, what he's doing, hyper, probably doing, okay? We're not going to say he's doing this for sure, but this is probably what he's doing, is he's thinking yeah, with probably. his penis, okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> of course, of course, I don't, I don't want to say he's thinking that. It's just. I think that he probably wants this because he wants everyone to be free. Because I know it's a lot of atheists online. They want they a lot of them, most of them want to argue that there's no free will. They'll argue that there's no morality, subjective morality. It, it leads me to believe that it's because they don't want to be responsible on some stuff. They want everything what to be free. If I were to go people. full Nietzsche on my channel and say that um, we should have a right wing dictatorship and outlaw abortion and uh, et cetera, and, and throw the people who don't like it out of helicopters and so on. Oh, you mean and like, on the grounds that morality is relative, and so therefore I can do whatever I want. Jo yeah. Johanan, Johanan, mm -hmm. you do not you do not support dictatorship, but you support the right to choose dictatorship. Yes, yes, that's much more better. Much better. <laughs> yeah, that, that's true. I'm I actually have a, a meme. I have a meme. This is going to sound hilarious, guys. I have this meme from like way back. This is when Bush was in office. And there's this bunch of American flags in the back, and, and Bush is there, and he's got his hand. He's waving, but the angle of the camera makes it look like he's doing a Sieg Heil. And the, the title, it was one of those demotivators, and it said, Unitary Executive Theory. And then the caption was, Pro-choice. It's the decider's right to choose. Who are you to impose your morality on him? <laughs> by, the way, by the way, none of That's the, awesome. the, the pro-choice ethos was nowhere in evidence after the election of Trump. These people did not support the choice to elect Trump president. <laughs> no, they didn't. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> they, no, I, pray, I, I don't support Trump's presidency, but I support the choice to elect Trump. But no, they, they did not take that option. Right. Um, yeah, you know, you know I, funny, I even... many of these alt right people like 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 um Ubermensch atheist, right? He's like an atheist, and he's you know he's like the he's like the um Schopenhauerian version of like an idealistic atheist. He's a very rarefied form of atheism, but well, we kind of press him. He'll say he's a pantheist, but <laughs> what? Well, like like Nietzsche himself was actually part of the German idealist movement, right? So the thing about this is though, is he's like this big atheist. He's actually in favor of right-wing authoritarianism. He's part of the alt-right. He loves the notion of throwing leftists out of helicopters and so on. Right. Now, what's funny about this is I have no... I mean, this is... He represents... People like him represent a portion of the alt-right right now. There are people who are full Nietzscheans. They have like these Nietzschean philosophies. Like It's kind of unusual to see it. In a way, it kind of makes sense with the kind of the Marxist social justice thing as the, the, um, you know, the opposite. If you think of the Marxists as having the slave morality and then the you know, there is the Nietzscheans having the master morality, then opposing the Marxism kind of makes you, quote-unquote, right-wing. But what's weird is because, you know, if you're Nietzschean, you would naturally oppose Marxism, and, and for that matter, social justice warrior garbage, because you're going from this sort of Nietzschean master morality perspective. You're the Ubermensch. You get to enforce your morality on everyone. Right, um, and so the thing about this is, is it's kind of hilarious because it's like the chickens are coming home to roost. They've been arguing for this. Um, oh yeah, they've been arguing for this nihilism for a long time. In order and to now, it's come back to bite them. And now they're actually nihilists voting for Trump because they want to uh, dangle uh, leftists out of helicopters and so on because <laughs> morality is relative and that's their. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Um, I think we get the basic idea of what's going on. I, I uh, is it all right if we move on to the videos Messianic Mac made? Yeah, sure. That that's excellent. All right, then. Um, all right, so let's start off right now. If any of you have anything to say, just let me know. All right. All right. Okay. Now, when I play the video, um, uh, all right, none of you, um, all all of you, when you have something to say, I will know immediately when you start speaking. All right. Uh, all right. So here we go. Inspiring philosophy fanboys love spamming me with IP videos, presumably because they want a response, so I guess I'll oblige. In the next few videos, I'll look at the video he did on why he thinks science shows abortion to be immoral. Also, Veniloid uploaded his response to this video just before I finished mine, so check his out as well. I'll put a link in the description. This is an attack on the pro-choice or pro-abortion crowd. The people who think it's okay for any woman to have an abortion 
just because they want to. I don't know who has an abortion just because they want to have an abortion. I've never heard of anyone wanting to have an abortion per se. Women who choose to have abortions usually have them because they don't want to be pregnant and or don't want to endure going through labor or a cesarean. That abortion is not murder. It okay, this is what I'm talking about. Um, this, he, um, uh, that's basically what IP's meaning, okay? He, like, people want to have abortion because they don't want to have a child, basically. Not because they just want abortion per se. He's, this, this is the kind of thing I, I realized with Missy Man. Well, there is Lena Dunham who actually did say that she wants an abortion just to have one. Yeah, well, well, here's the thing. IP was trying to say that, I, I've Lena talked to IP Dunham, before. By the way, is someone who needs to swing for my helicopter, so. <laughs> okay, I. It's just, it's just crazy uh, with, with me thinking this. Uh, this is what Messi Mac does. He'll, he'll cherry pick what he says and run wild with it. That's what he always does. But let's get on with it. Of an abortion is perfectly fine. Doesn't harm anyone. This is one of the most unscientific beliefs out there today. It's unscientific because science does not and cannot demonstrate the moral significance or value of anything. How does one scientifically prove that killing anything is immoral? Science can show that a zygote is human. But how could it demonstrate that killing a human is immoral? The idea that killing a human being is wrong is not scientific. How would you empirically demonstrate the truth of such an idea? Which is okay. So oh, yeah, I was yeah. Okay, you go first. Yeah. Give him some points here. Give him some some points. No, no, here. you go ahead and go first. I'll catch later. Go ahead. Okay, so the thing I was gonna say is that you know this is like your classic Hume's guillotine is all separation gap sort of thing, right? Um and. The thing here is, like, it's presented as, well, you cannot derive uh, value from a state of affairs, and therefore, um, you can't you can't say that this that anything is wrong science based on science, right? And the thing the thing here is that this is actually, and, and I and I I don't have the resources to address you know this full out and say exactly how and why abortion is wrong or what situations it is or anything like that based on um, the actual metaphysics or whatever that you need to that you need to have in order to have a moral ontology. But basically this is essentially just a product a product of modernity, um, namely in the removal of fi final causality. If you if you can think back to Aristotle's four forms of causality um, from 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 reality. So basically, it, what, what do I mean by this? I mean that when you got to around Descartes, um, Descartes, Descartes removed the idea that things had a goal towards which they tended. And what that basically did was, was two things. The first thing was, sort of obvious, was that it actually distanced there from being any sort of rational reason why things would behave in a certain way. And so you couldn't just you couldn't use a priori reasoning to figure out anything about the natural world using that sort of framework, right? Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I, I I'm sorry. Go like, ahead. Uh, sorry. Yeah, it's fine. The thing that's more important though was that this actually also subtly destroyed any sort of notion of the natural world having having purpose. What do I mean by this? Well. If things have finality, then that means that they tend towards things. That means that, in a sense, um, those things, like such as yourself and myself, they do things for reasons. In other words, it's like I reach out to grab an apple because I want to eat the apple, right? Um, and the idea is that if, if, there is, if, there, if I'm doing things for reasons and if I am such that I am always doing things for reasons, then there is, rationally speaking, and this is the key point. This is, compu this is purely rationally a best way for me to do things in order to accomplish those reasons. In other words, there's a good for me that is I, 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 I behave in this particular pattern and what I intrinsically want, I get. And the thing is, I don't determine this because what ends up happening is the stuff that creates me, the way that my body is made, formed in the womb and all of that stuff, my DNA – all of that determines my aims, determines my, motiv my, my motivations. I have no control over that. That's objective. Those are objective. And therefore, the rules that I, I, I can derive as being 
the, the, these are the things that benefit me the most. These are the things that are good are objective. Yeah. And so in that sense, you'd get an objective morality. And with that, you'd be able to say that based on human nature, um, then there would be certain, there would be certain patterns of behavior that would contradict, that would contradict your human nature, that would mess up your goals. And therefore those would be bad actions. And then you'd say that, you know, if, if it were the case that abortion is immoral, which I think it is, but I, I don't know the exact argument that is used to show that, um, then what you do is you basically point out what it is that abortion does and then how that ends up destroying, destroying and subverting your faculties and thus destroying the intrinsic goal towards which you are oriented, thus harming you. And so the, the thing is that he, he just brings up this is all this is, is this odd thing of you know you can't fi find uh, you can't show that something is morally wrong based on science and and just blurts it out as though it's fact. Yeah. When really it's actually just the result of a certain philosophical paradigm that he's operating on, where he's already assumed a naturalist view of the world, where you can't have purposes or anything that you're going towards. The, yeah, this, yeah, yeah. this is my view is that it's not necessary for us to demonstrate that abortion is immoral to, to furnish a philosophical argument. I think it's sufficient to point out that nobody consistently lives under the kind of moral framework of the pro-choice movement. No one consistently lives under those principles. We all make an exception for abortion. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, I... It's just that IP was saying that everyone claims that abortion is not murder and doesn't cause harm to anyone. I mean, there are scientific claims of saying that what it what constitutes is something that's killing innocent life and something killing it's not. And IP didn't mention anything about immorality or morality right here. He's trying to say that science makes a claim right here. I I feel that it was just a what, the last what my son man just said was just a waste of time. Basically, what he just said. It's, well, 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 he was sort of well. What I, what I saw him doing was basically focusing on the ethical aspect instead of focusing on um, the fact that someone's getting hurt there. So, if you noticed, um, that the main thing that IP was trying to focus on was the fact that someone is getting killed. You know, it's someone getting killed, and you know, messianic didn't just, manic just didn't didn't really cover that. He just sort of was like, well, the idea that. Um, you know, it's morally wrong to do so that science can show that it's morally wrong to do abortion or something like that is nonsense. And so, like, that's what I wanted to focus on is that, you know, this sort of presupposition about what the, what sorts of things that science can and cannot say. Um, you know, that this, this is actually this is actually flawed, number one. And number two, it's actually if you read a lot of um, atheist materialistic um, ethicists. A lot of them will actually say that, you know, this is false because we can derive things uh, from like various various forms of ethical naturalism. Now, I, I don't agree with those necessarily um, because a lot of them try to also try to rescue things um, from this sort of non teleological aspect. Um, but as long as you have as long as you have this sort of teleological teleological framework. Um, and it is a complete, completely fact-based framework. There is no sort of is all distinct is all distinction there. There is no sort of gap to be to be bridged. My whole point was that he's touting this thing out, the statement out, like it's fact. A lot like the way that people, a lot new atheists would tout out, oh, you can't prove a negative, as though that's fact. When you know we we know that's false, and we know that um, his claim in this instance is also false. Right. Uh, let's continue on. The, that was a very good point. Let's continue on the video here. Pro-abortion crowd doesn't address the scientific arguments from the pro-life community and instead relies on appeals to emotion and straw man arguments. We are constantly told that the pro-life community just wants to take away a woman's right to choose and is a religiously motivated government power grab to remove the woman's right to her own body. I don't think the pro-life community just want those things, but I do think those things form part of the motivation of at least some pro-life advocates. Some pro-life Christians, Rick Santorum for example, are also opposed to vaccines for HPV. 
I strongly suspect that this is because they wish to preserve the threat of unwanted pregnancy and STIs as a disincentive to have extramarital or premarital sex. All of the evidence demonstrates quite easily that human life begins at conception, not at birth. According to everything science has revealed, this is just as much of a human as this is. Of course it is. I don't dispute that a fetus, or even a zygote, is human. What I dispute is the idea that a zygote is as morally significant as a self-aware entity. Being a and human, we being can a basically yeah. say that, yeah, right there we, we see that he's already presupposing that fetuses and zygotes can't be self, aren't self-aware entities. And Number that, two, that that's even relevant. I mean, like, a well, sleeping yeah, person is not a self-aware entity, and now I don't. Uh, d well, yeah, there there are plenty of moral, morally wrong things that don't involve that don't involve self-aware entities. At least if you're unfortunately if you're coming up from this sort of, um, if you're coming from this sort of like natural law aspect of things, then you know you'll you'll find that, you know, it's moral it's morally wrong. What's a good example? Like it's morally wrong to break your own to break your own property. Right now, yeah. that sounds absurd. It might sound absurd, but the, but the reason is that you brought you, you have your property for certain net for certain goals of your own, and if you break your own property, well, you're going to hurt yourself. You're you're not you're not going to be able to reach those goals as well as you would as you'd like to, um, as you'd like as you'd like to, um. So you're really just messing yourself over. Yeah, that's I would agree with that too. I mean, yeah. I at least give him some points for courageousness for admitting that the fetus is at least biologically a human. Yeah. Okay. So now, I'll... unfortunately, Hassan isn't on here. Um, if you know Hassan Mohammed, he's one of my, he's an atheist from Australia, and um, he he adopts. Despite being an atheist, he's very pro life, and his argument is he uses the Boethian um, view of personhood. Well, he'll point out that you know, like the, the the even like the zygote even is a person because it has the essence of like I mean there's rational agency is involved in being a person yes but that's not the only thing that makes a person a person it's that the per there, there there is a being that has an essence to be a rational being even if that essence is not yet activated so yes a very early fetus or an embryo or a zygote it may not yet be in, in conscious. And, you know, eventually it's not, it's not intelligent until, you know, later on anyway. But the thing is, is the fact that it has that, that essence in its nature. As very, as the, very much unlike a sperm or an ovum, which of course. Exactly. They don't, they don't have that essence by themselves. Yeah. They're not something that in its essential nature is a rational being. Yeah. Now, yeah, that's a fetus true, yeah. is in its rational, it, 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 its essence is the essence of a human being because it is a human being. Yeah, because that's very true. Human being so, means it has the essence of a human being, even if that of all that essence is not yet fully activated in the form of rationality. Its essence is to be a rational being. Right, uh, that's very true. You know, why are we assuming it's not human, even though it has human DNA? You know, you know that's not a religious argument by any stretch. I mean, the very fact that Hassan is an atheist demonstrates that that is not a um. That, I mean, not a religious argument. That's a sorry. It's a very rational argument. But it's not a religious argument. It's something religious about that at all it's right let's uh, continue on here the rights we regard as owed to a person are distinct things i see a person as any entity capable of understanding its own existence not all humans can do this and it may be the case that not all beings that can do this are human i consider murder to be the non-consensual ending of the life for reasons other than defense of an innocent entity which is or at some point has been aware of itself since a zygote has no such awareness killing a zygote is not murder there's not a Okay, this is... Yeah, he has qualifications to his qualifications there. Yeah, I know. You'll have to put uh, a lot of wiggle room. What about people that are, like, in vegetation states or in a coma? Well, no, because you he know? said if they have been in the past aware... I think I think he would so he say that it's not murder, exactly, than if, if, if you're talking about people who are in vegetative states. But, you know, that that's one of those things where, you know, you know, I, 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 I'd be hard-pressed to see him, like, like let's say, like, he... Uh, Let's let's say that it was like his mom or something who was in a situation. If we just posited that to him, um, oh yeah, would it be fine for someone to just come up and kill your mom if she's if she's in a coma or if she's in a vegetative state? Um, and you know, you and you don't know if she's going to come back or not or anything like that. She's obviously not self-aware. Well, 
you know, he, he might, he, he tried, he probably tried to backpedal or give, you know, sort of qualifications to his previous qualifications to sort of save that. Yeah. I think you're giving him too much credit there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, then uh, let's continue on here. We're out there that says life begins later on or at birth. Probably not, but you will find plenty of papers which describe sperm cells as living life. Per okay, here we go. This is now. I talked to Mike, and our, he's actually a biologist. Now he looked up those sources, and I did after he told me about this. It says nothing about sperm and these egg actually being considered as life, just like a virus. It, it's the the paper do say living, but they're using that context very differently. It's it's not the same thing. And again, IP never said, IP was saying human life, all right? He said at the very beginning of his video right here. But notice that when Mike makes a response to this video, he doesn't mention a little clip of when IP is saying human life in there. So he's going to go to the clip that says just life and then argue from that. That's right. Yeah, all go right. on. Yeah, let's go on. Huh? Oh, let's go on. Yeah, is what we were trying to say. All right. A actually does not begin at conception. It began several billion years ago and has been a continuous process. However, you probably just worded this very clumsily. I'm sure that what you mean is not merely that life begins at conception, but rather that human life begins at conception. Though, as I said, I don't believe murder ought to be defined merely as the killing of a member of the human species. Later in the video, IP will claim that the distinction between humans and persons is ad hoc. He seems to think that this is an arbitrary distinction, but valuing something merely because it is a member of the human species seems far more arbitrary to me. I see no reason why killing a newly fertilized zygote is any morally different from killing the two gametes that formed it. Why is a merely taxonomical difference such as this morally significant? By the way, uh... I, well, that is precisely morally significant because the taxonomy determines that someone is a human and as he pointed out with, you know, um, Hassan's argument, um, the Boethian view that, you know, depending on what species one belongs to, one has an essence associated with that species, and if that species happens to be an intelligent species, you know, it doesn't even have to be human, it could be Vulcans or, um, you know, Wookiees or whatever. You know, <laughs> Classic Johanan. Right, right, okay. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I mean, e even if... They don't have an essence to be intelligent, even if they're not yet intelligent, you know? E because they have that essence, that innate essence, then it, it's wrong to kill them. Yeah. Because if yeah. they are human beings, they have they have the properties of a person. Go on, uh, go ahead, deflate atheism. No, I, sh I was just going to say, even if, like, you, you would say something like, like uh, uh, you don't believe animals have, have the rights as humans... You could still say something like torturing an animal for fun is objectively wrong. You could still affirm things like that without necessarily giving them personhood, you know? Yeah, and then notice how Medicine Mag took, basically take out context of what IP was saying now. When IP was saying life begins at conception, what do you think kind of life he's talking about? Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's a popular atheism meme. I think I came from like Carl Sagan or something where he, where he said, when does life begin? Oh, well, life began three million years ago. It's three billion years ago. Whatever. Well, well, I know, but in the video, I, I've seen the video multiple times. IP does say human life does begin at conception. Yeah. And later on at the end of the video, he's saying that life begins at conception, repeats it again. And then Mesomatic just takes out Contes as saying, I think you mean human life because you word this so clumsily. He, yeah. It's obvious that he means human life. He mentioned that in the video. It's mm. that's, that's what they do. They take things out of context here. That's, mm. Yeah. I'll also notice that, that he, he always frames his arguments where, where it seems to me, and I don't see why, dot, dot, dot. It's what I call the seems to me argument, and that's, that's how uh, TMM always seems to fortify his arguments. He says, it seems to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He'll also say that I can't understand it. That's my yeah, argument. exactly. Oh, yeah. He'll also yeah, say I, mean, I don't make arguments. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like... I, this yeah, that, that, this opinion. sounds a lot like that sort of... So that sort of uh, sort of your theistic non cognitivists who say, well, I, I don't know what the definition of God is or what a God's supposed to be, so therefore it doesn't make any sense to say God exists or doesn't exist. It's like, no, that just means you're retarded. But <laughs> <laughs> and I know, yeah, I know it's 
it's just so crazy. It's like, I'm not arguing. It's based on my position, based on my consciousness, because consciousness, I can't accept it. <laughs> well, who gives a damn about your conscience? Sorry for the cussing, but really. No, no, it's okay. About, who cares about your particular position? We're not trying to talk about your what, what sort of sentiment that you're, you're holding. We're trying to talk about actual ethics here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. His fanboys do, yeah. Yeah. It begins a conception. So by logic, no one is trying to attack a woman's right to her body. Okay, you clearly don't know how logic works if you think that follows by logic. Even if life begins a conception, it would in no way follow that no one is trying to attack a woman's right to her body. It could be the case that life begins a conception and also that at least some people are motivated to oppose abortion, not primarily by the belief that a fetus is a human life, but rather by the desire to preserve the risk of unwanted pregnancy as a deterrent to having non-monogamous sex, which would constitute an attack on bodily autonomy. However, you clearly have the writing skills of a Zamboni on Valium, so in the name of charity, I'm going to assume that what you meant to say was that it is not necessarily the case that pro-lifers are attacking a woman's right to bodily autonomy. I agree, but again, I think it's clear that at least some are. Because th now, here's again, he just doesn't take out context, right? Like, he knows that no one's attacking his wounds for a body. That's what he. That's what IP said. I mean, I don't understand what. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think he actually has a fair point here, is which is that, you know, um, just because life begins at conception does not necessarily mean, and and you know, a lot of people who are who are trying to oppose abortion are trying to save living baby, you know, living fetuses, living babies from getting killed. Um, doesn't mean necessarily that there aren't those people out there who are um, against abortion solely for the sake of um, of essentially of essential of essentially con controlling whether or not someone can have unprotected sex. So there there might be there may be people out there who are actually who I, who I, I don't I, I can't really think of anyone who would rationally think this way off the top of my head. But you know at the same time I can't think of anyone who would rationally just want babies to be killed um off the top of my head really other than you know people who are just like complete hedonists yeah but Go with that, for that for, with that with that said you know there, there might be people out there who are um who literally don't care about the fetus and just want to stick people with a baby and you know even think of it as punishment though that the thinking of having a baby as punishment thing is sort of one of those things where I think it's almost like that's playing into their rhetoric because that's the way the left thinks instead. Yeah, there, yeah. there, there, yeah, there is a it's a fallacy called bulverism where you speculate about someone's ulterior motives. And like, let's think what we said before, where we said, "Oh well, well, people only embrace uh, moral relativism so they can live a hedonistic lifestyle or something." So we could, you know, if we were to use that as a pretext. For dismissing uh, uh, materialism or, or, or moral relativism, yeah, that would be wrong. Exactly. But, uh, all my life, when I was growing up, that's all I heard. <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> it is, uh, oh yeah, pro-lifers only want to control women's bodies, uh, just for the sake of control. Like there was no rational reason. They just pro-lifers want to control for the sake of control, and that was used to dismiss uh, the entire pro-life movement. Now that poisonous idea. <laughs> Has seems to have swallowed the whole of liberalism, including atheism. Now, now, bul bulverism arguments are just considered accepted. So, yes. Right, right. That I would, I would agree with that. Yeah. Yep. I mean, there are some people who are saying that pro life only wants to attack the woman's body, but no, pro life only wants to protect the baby inside. All right, that's trying what IP's been trying to say here. And yeah, yeah. So now let's continue on. Is not her body. It is a new human with its own body currently developing, just like a three-month-old is and a three-year-old is. Uh, no. Not just like a three-month-old or a three-year-old is. There's at least one important difference, that being that a three-month-old or a three-year-old doesn't have to push its way through anyone's birth canal against their will in order to continue their existence. Until the pro- uh. That has literally nothing to do with whether or not a fetus is part of a woman's body. So it's like, it's like, yeah, sure. The the fetus doesn't. The fetus has to push its way out, 
but what does it matter by location? Um, no, this, I, 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 I understand what he's trying to do, but it's just, it's not really working. Can I, can I bring up a little example if I don't choke to death here before I can get it all out? Yeah, all go right. ahead. I'm sorry. But so, so what TMM is saying here and what pro-choicers tend to say in general is that the right to bodily autonomy is absolute, except if you're a fetus. But we, we won't even touch that. So the right to bodily autonomy is absolute, even if it causes the fetus pain, even if it is the taking of the human life. That doesn't matter because the right, the woman's right, at least, to bodily autonomy is absolute. Now, I'm going to go completely off, uh, off, uh, off the wall here, but do you guys remember a news item from uh, several years ago? There was a cruise ship off the coast of Italy called the Costa Concordia, and it sank. Now, the captain did everything he, did, he could do to save his own life and did nothing to protect the passengers. He was uh, eventually brought to trial because he was responsible for all those other passengers. So his right to bodily autonomy was not absolute because, because he had to put his own life at risk to save everyone else. So if we could if we could point to a case like that where a person's right to bodily autonomy is not absolute, why should we extend it to a woman carrying a fetus? Yeah, that's a that's a good point. And then the other part I'd like to critique is um, this sort of notion of rights um, without 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 a sort of law, which is that what rights are is they are fundamentally. Um, they're fundamentally edicts which say that someone should be allowed, someone would have to be allowed to do such and such a thing. And if someone else, else tries to prevent that person from doing such and such a thing, that person will be punished, right? So, you know, we have our, we have our uh, Bill of Rights um, in the Declaration of Independence and the way things are supposed to work anyways, um, which, you know, we, we've been seeing that they aren't exactly working that way is that if say our fifth amendment rights or our fourth amendment rights are violated um if our, if our rights are violated let's say that we're being spied on and uh that evidence is being used that's obtained illegally is being is being used basically to hunt us down and then uh capture us throw us in prison or whatever um without our with, without our consent or you know just all that information is being obtained obtained from us uh, well, what's supposed to happen is that there's supposed to be oversight um, above, above, the, above the government such that the people who are doing this get in trouble with that, right? So rights are actually a sort of legal construct which requires that there is a judiciary body and something out there to enforce that law. So when we, when we hear about, about abortion rights, um, what we are hearing about this sort of uh, right to, you know, a woman's right to bodily autonomy or whatever, but we're actually hearing, um, unless we're unless we're saying unless they're giving a descriptive argument about um, about what the what the current status of the law is, unless they're saying that and seeing that alone and not trying to say anything at all about ethics, which we you know that they are not. Yeah, we know not just doing that. Then what they are do what they are doing is they're actually implicitly assuming a sort of theistic framework in which there's you know there's God or or the gods or something out there that's basically watching and if and if someone the trouble in, is is that many of them have a very positivistic view of well, um, well the thing is the thing is, legal positivism well well the thing is there is a thing though is that this idea of rights that they're using is actually just wrong it's not. It doesn't. It doesn't at all work. Fit the definition. It's basically just asserting that we feel we would like people to have to be able to um, have this bodily autonomy. At um, absolutely, that's really what they're asser asserting. It's really just their um, emotivistic grunts, um, because you can't have rights in this sort of not in this, in, in this sort of atheistic view. You just yeah, can't. Yeah. It's impossible. Well, there, there's, a, there's a constant a kind of equivocation fallacy between rights as they are codified by man and rights as the thing those codified laws describe. Just like we talk about uh, the laws of physics, things, things in the universe do not move around because the mathematician uh, 
uh, scribbled some equations or something. We, we have the separation that there, there is the codified uh, uh, law and there is the thing that the law describes. And it's, it's the source of no end of confusion, especially for atheists, especially for materialists. But without, without the kind of transcendent right that the codified right, uh, that the right that is written by man describes, that a right is simply another arbitrary edict of the state, and no one, no one can, can, can consistently believe that a right is simply an arbitrary uh, construct of the state. Right, well, they can, however, when that happens, the mask comes off and it becomes obvious what's going on. Like, it's, yeah. Yeah. they'll say that, you know, it's because we as a society, the rights come from society, and we, we as a society decided this, and like, yeah, you just made this up and you imposed this. This is the mother imposing on the baby. This is, this is you know, or, or, and, and you imposing on the rest of us. Stop it. Yes. There's no basis for this at all. It's just, it's naked force. And right. at that point, it becomes, once, once the smoke screen on that has been, um, you know, blown away, then that's how you get, um, you know, big political movements that, like, the type that elected Donald Trump in there, you know? Let's go in and steamroll the left because they they have no they're, they're the emperor is naked now everyone sees it and um, you know the justification it's it's all it, everyone sees what it's just a naked power play yeah t- and then t- after t- that it's it's just a matter of who can seize the power but but the thing is is that especially for the pro choice movement they think they can cow their opponents with rhetoric. Oh they, yeah, they can't they, though because I mean they were like, able to do it in political women will all be so terrified of incurring their wrath that we, we will keep our thinking in the, in this little. No, that, that's where you just go in there and you 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 have to you have to offend these people and yeah. make like what, what Trump was doing in a way he just comes in and just steamrolls these people and then you know when when basically they complain about it you basically give them two middle fingers to a cheering crowd you know. That that's kind of kind of off topic, but I like like when an atheist says, "Oh, well, is your fear of hell the only thing that's going, that's going to prevent you from murdering someone?" You could just tell them, "So what if it is?" You know. <laughs> because, I mean, apparently, with you, I mean, you know, their lack of a fear in hell is causing them to murder people and yeah. trying to justify it with a bunch of BS. So that that's my just throw that Molotov cocktail in there, you know. Oh yeah, they need more of that. You know, this is what really frustrates me about the conservative movement and. Unfortunately, I'm mean, I'm kind of like iffy about if Trump is really pro life or not. But I mean, he's better than you know Hillary, obviously, or was. But the Absolutely. thing with this is, is what really bugged me for the longest time is the conservative movement was they weren't reactionary enough. They were they were too nicey. They would always cow to political correctness as such, and because of they get pushed around constantly, and they would never win because they were too nice and quote unquote Christian and and so on and. You can't win if you're constantly cowed by political correctness. Yeah, you have to be able to bulldoze. Okay, if they're gonna, if, if you're de- especially if you're dealing with the left, because the left, once you take all the smoke screens off, all they have is moral subjectivism combined with power politics. That's all it is: is power politics. That's the only thing they have going. Like, we have the more voters, so therefore we're going to um, allow abortion, so people can get killer kids. Well. Why not just, if that's the case, if that's all that really is, if that's all politics really is, why not just seize the, you know, the means of political force and um, start dangling leftists from helicopters? Well, I I love the way that you sort of uh, took the, seize the means of idea from like Marx and basically. I know. (laughs) Seize the means of political authority. Let's see. Let's get on to the video. On the logical means of production, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. Lavi made a lot of good points here. Abortion crowd can provide any scientific evidence that a fetus is part of the woman's body. They cannot say the pro-life movement is an attack on a woman's use of her body. IP says that the fetus is not the woman's body, as though it has nothing to do with her body and places no burden on it whatsoever. The mere fact that the survival. Like, this is not what he said. He said it's not a part of the woman's body. It's not saying that it has nothing to do with the woman's body, but it's just saying that the fetus is not a part of the woman's body. So logically, it's not, you're not, you're not talking about controlling the, the, the woman, the woman preventing her, preventing her from using, 
preventing her from her own bodily autonomy over her own body parts, you're talking about stopping the woman from killing another being that is living in her body. And that's the difference. But here we go with the straw man. Yep. Yep. That's just what he does. A woman to endure the birthing process makes her pregnancy a bodily autonomy issue. This is... Now, now it may affect her body, but that doesn't mean scientifically that the fetus is a part of her body. Okay, that's that's not true. Like, that's and here's not a bodily on. autonomy issue because the fetus is part of the woman's body. It's a bodily autonomy issue because of the effects the fetus has on the woman's body. If someone believes that a woman ought to be forced to give birth against her will, I would consider that to be an attack on her bodily autonomy. Call me crazy. Actually, okay, I he has a that. fair point there, but I would say that the bodily the bodily autonomy issue is secondary in this case to, or at least on the pro life side, it's secondary to the issue of a woman killing another human being. Well, I know, and he says that the autonomy body issue is because the fetus is part of the woman's body. First of all, no, it's not. That is so stupid. That's just scientifically inaccurate. I mean. Well, well, yeah, he he actually he actually backed off of that in the set in his second slide there, um, and then said that it's not because the the fetus is part of the body, but it's because, um, you know, the fetus has an impact on the on on the body of the mother, and, you know, if, you know, it, 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 he goes on to say that you know he doesn't want he doesn't like the idea of a woman being forced to give birth to a baby. That's well, so. Well, so 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 because the fetus what is dependent on it. I mean, there's people depend on life support. I mean, yeah. I mean, it, it is just a complete BS. You know what? Here's the thing: if Mesoch Mac ever finds this video, I want him to show an evidence, some kind of scientific paper, anything to show that the fetus is the woman's body. Any scientific evidence whatsoever. Let's see if he can find it because well, so far he hasn't showed any scientific evidence whatsoever. Yeah, and, and and can we just admit that this whole thing that that bodily autonomy is some principle that rules supreme over everything else is just something they pulled out of their asses. Oh well, yeah, let, where did this idea? Well, come yeah, we don't we don't even need to like. Well, I guess we probably do now to address that. But I did a whole video know, debunking that the hard. whole notion that whole bodily autonomy argument. I did a whole video debunking that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Well, well, the thing is, this is this is like a symptom. This is a symptom of the problem I was mentioning earlier. This whole problem where we don't know about ethics, we don't know how to derive ethics. We a lot of us don't even know what the word "good" means enough to answer G. E. Moore's open question dilemma um, in a, in a satisfactory way that you know doesn't that that meets the criteria. And so, because of that, because a lot of because a lot of people just don't understand ethics, we have this problem where. Whatever someone's, whatever a group says, if they can make it popular enough, that's what people will believe because they just don't know anything about ethics. Yeah, I know. At the end of when he says, call me crazy, I was thinking, yeah, I would call you crazy over that. You're insane. <laughs> you should be called the messianic maniac. Maniac just. Yeah. I mean, this, this is the thing. I, I honestly, and you, you can, you can uh, disparage me for this all you want. I've kind of, I've kind of always had a Rousseauian view of, of human rights that we have the rights that we have in a state of nature, and all, all sorts of uh, modern uh, artifices kind of take away from that. But yeah, uh, women giving birth to children was the way it worked for hundreds of thousands of years. It was white uh, male imperialist colonialist technology. That kind of changed that scenario, and that's where they think their rights come from. Yeah. Here, let's uh, continue on here. What if this innocent child developing is a woman as well? Doesn't she have a right to her body? Supposing we go off this unfounded principle that the fetus is the mother's body, aren't there also situations in which even abortion advocates themselves would say it is immoral to have an abortion? For instance, what if a fanatic mother prefers to have an abortion? just because the fetus will grow up to be a girl? What if in the future it could be determined in the womb whether someone will grow up to be gay or straight? Wouldn't abortion advocates say that in those situations it is immoral for the mother to kill the gay fetus just because the mother doesn't want to have a child that's gay? We have used such a practice as unjust, immoral, and cruel. But why? Does this mean the fetus has rights in those circumstances which supersede the rights of the mother? 
No. I would consider sex-selective abortion to be immoral, but would the fact that the person who wants the abortion has immoral motivations justify forcing her to give birth against her will? In my opinion, no. Forcing her to give birth against her will is even more morally reprehensible than sex-selective abortion. Should we... That's just well, ridiculous. so he just came out and um, yeah. essentially, he essentially is arguing from a moral realist standpoint now. So now, now, we, now we're seeing the switcheroo, which is sort of I want to I want to just hold this sort of subjective morality view, and then now all of a sudden, I want to be able to claim things are morally reprehensible. Yeah, and, and we see this a lot. Yeah, it, yeah, we see this a lot. It's all relative to my point of view. Uh, abortion is worse. It, it's not. It's not immoral, but only if you do it for the right reasons. Yeah. It, it also kind of reminds me of the thing where 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 a man might uh you know. Uh, be guilty of battery against a woman and, and if she miscarries then he's guilty of murder whereas if she aborts it then there is no murder but yeah mm. alright yeah let's go on Guys, that all fetuses per se have some intrinsic worth? I think we should place some value on fetuses, yes, but I don't value any fetus so much that I think its preservation justifies forcing anyone to give birth against their will Okay, so that tells us what he means about what he, his valuation of human life. His valuation of human life is such that, you know, it's fine to kill somebody, um, in order to in order to prevent. It's it's just perfectly it's perfectly fine to kill somebody in order to prevent, um, someone else from having to give birth against their will, and you know you know there's the whole thing about you know adoption and all of that, and. To be honest, it doesn't look like it doesn't look like he'd even he, he'd even it would even change his mind if there was perfect adoption. There, there was a perfect adoption system uh, that the baby that the babies would be absolutely guaranteed to uh, be raised by responsible parents if they weren't aborted. It wouldn't change his mind on um, on, on this on this whole thing of not a, 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 on this whole thing of, of aborting babies because he thinks of childbirth apparently as being so painful or bad yeah. that it, it, it's it's worse than the dismemberment and death of a of, of, a, of a human being I, so, I wonder i wonder if what at the bottom of it all it, it's just it's just this notion of, of rights being motivated by a sort of pragmatics uh let's say that we had a, a device that could teleport the fetus out of a woman in, in into a kind of incubation chamber, so that we could do it. So, so it's not necessary to uh, terminate the the fetus to do so. I wonder if then, just as a matter of pragmatics, you would say, yeah, though the the fetus has a right to life. Some would say so, but yeah. then there is these stupid feminist philosophers that that actually have gone to that that point, and they said, even if artificial wombs are created. They should still kill it because it's it's um, economic burden on the mother or something like that. And like, oh wait, wait, even mother, even if you're talking about, uh, yeah, it's totally know. screwed up. They have this notion like it's almost like this trying to like read this sort of matter, you know, the whole notion of a pater familias in Rome. The head of the house could kill anyone underneath. Uh, it's like yeah. the same thing applied to mother. It's like a matter familias. You yeah, know? matter <laughs> matter familia. It's matter essentially familia. what they were arguing for. I mean, it was. It, I don't know how the heck they were doing this, but they, they were. They were these feminist philosophers were running this, <laughs> arguing for essentially a matter familias. Is you know, the mother should be allowed to kill the kid because. Johanan, do you mean to tell me that feminist philosophers said something that was crazy? <laughs> <laughs> you know what's a shame now of course you know messianic manic hasn't really gotten into this but there are a lot of atheists right now that just hate feminism like you see it like i'm just kind of like complaining about this because i i, I kind of you know enjoyed back when they used to have you know atheist versus theist and that's i mean it's still going on to a degree but it's dried up and if you go to like thunderfoot's channel or the amazing atheist channel all they do are talk about feminism and social justice warrior stuff. Yeah, that's their next they, target, basically. I mean, literally, yeah. that's all they do. I mean, I don't mind that. That's great and all that they do that, but, like, it's kind of, you know, like, oh, man, we lost. But the other thing about this is, is if they're going to target feminism, why don't some of them go after abortion? Yeah, I, mean, well, I saw, no. I saw, um, sorry, well, yeah, okay, I kind of do that a little bit. Is. This is this is kind of I've had this discussion before, and I'm just going to throw this out there. I'm not going to really commit to anything, but I think it is kind of what I call like uh, 
the kind of man show anti-feminism where, where you have these basically man children and they live in their little uh, they live in their little man boy worlds with their video games and they're very happy in their little worlds and they don't like anything that makes an imposition from outside. So they'll go along with feminist principles as long as it makes no demands of them. So they'll say, oh, well, yeah, a woman has a right to a abortion. Sure, whatever. That, that works for me. But as soon as they start limiting their expression, then it becomes a problem. So I think it's more motivated by kind of indolence and laziness and, and just this kind of entitlement uh, sensibility for, uh, for uh, many anti-feminists. Yeah, I know, but oh, you got sure, I know, but the thing about it, some of this is, is, you know, there's the whole, you know, penis head motivation for some of these people, yeah, right? Yeah. Oh, but yeah, what's really interesting, I mean, a lot of these same people, though, are not even having sex. Like, they're, they're the MGTOW, you know, you've heard of the so-called sexodus, right? Millennials are not having <laughs> sex. And it's partly because of the feminism thing, and it's partly because of the, you know, they're too lazy. They're just like, oh, let's just look at pornography and jack off and play computer games. Yeah. Yeah. And they're too lazy to even have, you know, to like find a girl and, and, and so on. Have a and if that's the case, and if that's the way most of these atheists are, or many of them are, what do they even have to lose by opposing abortion anymore? Even if that's their motivation, they, they're not going to do that anyway. Why would they want to oppose? I mean, there's no Because they would involve it. caring about something beyond themselves. Right, but yeah. what I'm getting at is, I mean, they're already, you know, they like bashing feminism for, for the fun of it, right? I mean, if feminism does need to be bashed, but like... I mean, I'm, I'm seriously saying this because I'm, I'm starting to think that it's possible you can get some of these MGTOW slash sexist types of people that also have to be atheists and just convert them to the pro-life side. Because, you know, as long as it, I'm, I'm guessing the reason TMM is holding to these ridiculous views and if you, if you look at his value system, it doesn't even seem like his values would internally hold up. Yeah, the well, example I gave with him being, you know, postnatally aborted for the sake of keeping abortion legal. That's the thing. You're not going to have any luck with that because you're up against a worldview that is motivated by... by right, right. But what I'm saying is a lot of them are too lazy to even think like that. So yeah. what I'm getting at is you, you could have... I mean, in the Messianic Manics case, I suspect it's because he has the penis head motivation, okay? But what I'm saying is I'm guessing we can nick off a chunk of the atheists that are, you know, the, in the sexist slash MGTOW crowd. And some of them even, you know, kind of like, I think Sargon of a Cat is sort of in the alt-right. Is he even an atheist? I think he's an atheist, but I... Most definitely. Me, me and uh, Escaping okay. Atheist have discussed that, yes. Yeah, okay. He, he's not like the normal... He's he's actually right of center, from what I understand, and he's he's kind of in the alt-right crowd. I'm, I'm guessing you can you can get some of those people... And he's been on record saying that abortion, it, it, it's something that should be shamed. I should have a level of shame. Christopher Hitchens has some... Has some oh, I know. I've seen that, too. But what I'm getting at is that... that some of these people, especially with the whole sexist MGTOW crowd, you can pull some of them off, and I'm guessing you can make some. They're of them pulling off. themselves off, yeah. Yeah, but, but they, they they could be potentially converted to the pro life side because they don't have the motivation. They wouldn't even have the kind of motivation that I suspect someone like TMM has. Okay, okay, good to know. Let's uh, let's continue on here. Of course, when you bring this scientific evidence up to people who are okay with the murder of a child, they will ignore it and appeal to philosophy. Now, where have I seen this tactic before of ignoring science and appealing to philosophy? So every time someone points out that a question is a philosophical one rather than a scientific one, they're no better than creationists? Do you now, I want to stop this right here. No, that's not what he's saying at all. I mean... No, but pro-abortion and creationists do the same thing. They both reject science in, you know, of ad hoc definitions of what they think is right. That's what he's trying to go for. And here, let's continue on here. I believe there is no circumstance in which it is legitimate to judge an issue to be philosophical rather than scientific. The question of what constitutes murder is a moral question, and morality is not a fucking science. Science provide useful information to those considering moral questions, but it cannot ultimately decide them. All right. Go ahead. Did I cut someone off? No, we're here. Yeah, like, we're good. All right. All right. Now, listen, 
he IP never said it was a question of uh, was a question of science. IP was saying that the question of science when it comes to the position when life begins. Then I and then and then since we know that life begins at conception by the basic ideas of human understanding of morality, we don't have right to murder an innocent life. I mean, mm -hmm. so he's basically taking out context and he's, he's just lying at this point. Yeah, mm -hmm. he, right now he's just trying to he's just trying to like use the whole. See, like, I, I what he, what what IP was getting at was that the way that this often works is that your pro-abortion people will manipulate language and try to try try to basically say, oh, well, you know, it's not a human being at that point, or it's not a person or whatever, and then therefore you can just kill it. But and then, you know, TMM is interjecting here, basically pretending that's not what happens. He just twists everything around. I swear, Mesong Manic, his tongue is so twisted he can open a wine bottle. He just <laughs> with that. <laughs> oh yeah, it, it's just. I mean, at one time he tries to like translate my idealism into solipsism. That was ridiculous. Like, I mean, seriously, <laughs> like, you know what's funny about that is Hoffman's model is essentially. I mean, I adopt objective idealism, which is essentially the philosophic, you know, version of Hoffman's model. Office model uses multiple conscious agents. You know, it's like it's 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 not. Yes, solipsism is a form of idealism, but that doesn't mean all idealism is solipsism. You know, and it's just such a stupid straw man. It's like eliminative materialism is a form of realism, but that doesn't mean that all forms of realism are eliminative materialism. Mm. By, by the way, that reminds me of another error. It, it, I felt so ridiculous. I even needed to point this out, but this was in one of my videos. Is I was talking about God as a cause. And then he starts talking about the four fundamental forces. And then he, he, I said, no, I'm not saying God is a fundamental force. It's a well, fundamental, fundamental forces are causes. I'm like, well, even if you grant that, that does not mean that God is a fundamental force. This guy has serious problems with, with just bullying logic, you know? Well, the thing about it is, is I think he's just, I get the impression some of these times that he's gotten to the point where he's just like manipulating stuff to like, like it's not even coherent philosophy. Yeah, I to make that yeah. Would be more accurate to say he's making it up as he goes. Which through. makes me wonder if this is really just like politically motivated. Yeah, you know, to attack because he doesn't like the political effects theism has on a society, and like it's it's. <laughs> I mean, have have you looked at his patreons? I mean, I mean, he churns the shit out, but he's getting paid for it, so it doesn't it doesn't really matter. Just oh, about. that that's that aspect too. Yeah. Well, of course, every atheist on on the planet's funding him. I mean, yeah. He, yeah, Have you seen Aaron Ross? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Have you seen Aaron Ross' Patreon? Yes, I actually have. That is ridiculous. That is just ridiculous. Well, he's big in Texas, from what I hear. I know, but it's still ridiculous. Like, like he, he like. <laughs> You've seen Mad Dead. Uh, like, uh, who are these clowns? Matt you know? Dillon. Yeah, like that guy. His pay. I think I saw his Patreon one time. His was really high too. Like. But yeah, um, I didn't know Matt Dillahunty was on on YouTube. No, no, he's not. Well, he does like debates. There's some oh, YouTube right. uploaded like that. But I think he has a Patreon. I could be mistaken. But yeah, um, you know, it amazes me when I when I see this. I'm surprised no one else sees this. It just makes me think there's just a bunch of dumb sheep that follow Messianic Manic, really, or people who think just like him. And then um, that's the only conclusion I could come to. But yeah, here, let's... What works here as well? Non-fucking-sequitur. Most Young Earth theories make no assertions about morality at all. Now, see, he's taking them out of context again. You know, he's not... IP's not arguing that it's making theories. The IP is trying to say that the pro-abortion and the, the Young Earth creationism make the same thing. They make ad hoc definitions of what they think is true, and they'll reject science. And again, he just twists it around again. Like, yeah. Go on. Go ahead, John. Um, I think I, I keep going with the video. All right, then. Yeah, just. They try to say, well, a fetus is not a person. The genetic existence of a human may begin at conception, but it is not a person yet. But to do this would just be to make up an ad hoc definition. 
Since it is the case that most of us would consider the arbitrary killing of a self-aware non-human to be murder, it is clear that defining murder only as the killing of an innocent human is not adequate. It's obviously not that simple. We need to distinguish between personhood and humanity in order to deal with this problem. That's why this definition is not ad hoc. It is not arbitrary. It is not because we say so. It's because your definition of murder doesn't fucking work. In Wait, so now he's okay, let's let's just go back. Um wanna go to the Google? Just look up the Google Google like right quick of murder. Okay. It says Me I do, it, I, it, do I do I do I look up Google? Well yeah, I would like you to just post it on the post it so that everyone can see it though. Um it's like what I'm seeing is it's saying murder noun Google's definition, the unlawful premeditated killing of one human being by another. There we go. Case closed. Yeah. One human being, a fetus is a human being, and abortion means that you're killing a, that you're killing a fetus, and, and often you premeditate it. Um, and so, like, the only case right now is that it's lawful right now, so it's technically not murder by, by being lawful, but before the, before, you know, before the law's change that way um it was unlawful so before then it was murder if we want to go by that definition well again uh, you know ip's point is simple you know we show that it has a human life all right it's you know life starts the human life starts at the conception right it has the ability to become an actual person all right it and there actually has been stu scientific studies to show that it actually does develop consciousness like around week 12 around that time I, I mean i was actually when i first saw this video like months ago i was kind of skeptical but there's just so much uh, pack into so much put into it so and, you know it, it, here's the problem with me song mac every time they define you know an ad hoc definition what murder is it, it it's just based on his own opinion it's not actual science or fact you know it's it's not and then he'll use saying, well, you can't use science or facts, you know, for, you know, morality. And he'll use that bait and switch, basically. He'll switch something around. He creates a straw man. Anyways, let's continue on here. Philosophical view can lead to very devastating consequences. You are explicitly making an argument at consequentium here. What? Go ahead. Okay, well, I didn't have anything to say, but yeah, that, I mean... Oh, you didn't? Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, okay. Did do you want me to continue? Yeah. yeah okay, let's okay. Go. Let's open a history book and see what happened the last time a group of people decided another group of people were not actually people and not worthy of life and liberty. Defining personhood as self-awareness would not lead to anyone being denied any rights that they have the capacity to value. Also, the concept of personhood, while excluding some humans, could include entities other than humans. If IP believes that rights are contingent upon merely membership in the human species, then on what moral ground could IP say that it is wrong to enslave an intelligent extraterrestrial? If I All right. No. This, I mean, I, I kind of actually addressed this indirectly beforehand when I brought up the whole Vulcan and Wookiee situation, right? You know, it, it's it's not that it's it's self-aware, but it's not that it's it's not just the self-awareness itself. It's that there is, it's not belonging just to the human species either. It's the fact that the entity involved has a identity whose essence is to be a rational agent, even if that essence is not fully activated yet. Yeah, and uh, IP never said it's that. part of the essential nature of a human, a Vulcan, and a Wookiee to be a rational agent, even if it could be a Vulcan fetus or, you know, a Wookiee fetus or something, right? In fact, even on yeah, Star I mean, Trek, they had a scenario where there was uh, Deanna Troy, who's not, you know, she's like half Betazoid, right? And she was... Um, actually, yeah. <laughs> what? Never mind, I'm, I'm, I'm making fun. Yeah, she, she she was impregnated by some weird uh, non corporeal entity on the ship, and um, so basically it was guess her all her DNA. And, but so that would be a good example. And then they brought up abortion in the in the episode, and she's like, "I'm having this baby," and so on. And perfect example. It's a it's a non it's a, there's an alien baby there, you know, and we're not aborting the baby because it's you can tell. I mean, the whole thing with Star Trek kind of makes it simpler because I mean it's very obvious that you know. There's these aliens there, but they're essentially they're human in their nature, right? 
maybe they're a little bit different or something in their personality and some of their cultures and, and, and but there's a essential aspect of them that it's the same thing that we would identify as personhood in a human being is identified in them. And so by that logic, it would be just the most obvious intuitive thing in the world that you should not be aborting, you know, baby aliens in Star Trek, you know, because they're, they're they have, the, they have that innate nature or it's part of their innate essence to be a rational agent. Even if that rational agency is not something that is active yet. I think I understand what you're saying, uh, but you know, you know, I would actually look into it to see, you know, wh which of course, you know, which, which is pretty much what you say, what you said, it, yeah, it makes true. But I, I think if there was like extraterrestrial aliens, I think we'd have to look into their own life, be, life having begun at conception and see mm -hmm. if it's going to be like, what is it going to be like some different or, you know, yeah, like, it's going to have some kind of clear Mark, demarcation where there's the beginning of a new organism, you know. Well, that, that's yes. Like, and, yeah. and, and the, the virtue of of that view is is that is it is non arbitrary. It's not saying like like oh, it's murder if it happens after after you know ten weeks or something. It, it's non arbitrary. Yeah. Let's continue on here. Is that it would be wrong to enslave an alien, then he clearly understands that rights are granted for reasons other than merely being human. Bestowing legal recognition of personhood at birth provides a clear and consistent standard without morally or legally obligating anyone to give birth against their will. Forcing someone to endure that for the sake of the tiny cluster of cells that make up a zygote is not something my conscience can tolerate. Again, with his consciousness, not based on science, right? Well, the thing about that is, is that you know what's kind of stupid about this, and I've seen pro aborts do this all the time, and it really infuriates me. Well, firstly, you can make the Boethian argument that the zygote is a person, okay? All right? I mean, that's just you know, even even Hassan, who is an atheist, makes that point. But the thing about this is, is that abortions aren't even done that early, so they're playing an emotional appeal. They're they're doing is, you know, if you look at the kind of development stages that abortions occur at, they're clearly like what you would think of as persons or, you know, you see, you identify them as a human being with a face, fingerprints, the heartbeat, etc. right? Oh yeah. When they fully develop those later on. Yeah. Like yeah, even, uh, even in the first, second trimester, you know, they're, they're, they're developed enough that you can see there is a person there, you know? Yeah. When you close. have when, abortions though are not surgical abortions are not done until after the sixth week. And by that time, it's developed enough that you can see it looks like a person. So now he's playing this kind of counter, like it's an upside down appeal to emotion, as it were. Like he's taking out like the obvious. He's trying to make it like almost like it's a, a appeal to dehumanization, right? Right. You know, and uh, most and even he, even yeah. if I were to grant that you could divide personhood up like that, right? Even if you're going to do that and say, okay, the zygote is not a person, the fetus is, etc. You can't really do that. But if even if you were to do that. It's very clear that the, you know, what's being aborted is not a, quote, clump of cells. It doesn't even have any bearing or appearance to a clump of cells. And they're only using that. They're using that extreme case because they like to, it, it, it's, it's a way to grab emotional appeal to their audience. To make it sound like the pro-life view is ridiculous when, you know, frankly, any of the personhood models will have, quote, unquote, extremum points, okay? You know, bite the bullet points. Yeah. I, I, I mean, yes, and the zygote, I, it's, it's a person, but I will also admit that that is a bite the bullet point of the pro-life or Boethian model of personhood, okay? But if you look at their bite the bullet points, they're even more ridiculous, okay? You end up with either it's arbitrary, like it's defined by legalistic positive, which is ridiculous, or it's imprecise, where there's like this kind of fading into personhood, like it's like, and you end up, if you go down that approach, you end up with even more insane nonsense, like, you know, Peter Peter Singer is a good example of someone who argues for the fading into personhood concept. And he's gone off complete looney tunes where he's in favor of, you know, giving animal rights while at the same time endorsing infanticide on grounds of, you know, well, abortion is okay, and um, and the reason it's okay is because they're not really persons yet, because they're not intelligent yet, and it, it fades into that. And since unborn and since born feet uh foreign children are um you know, not really intelligent, then we can abort them up to like 18 months later or something like, you know, yeah, post birth, like, like children, uh, uh, post they, they're not fully self aware until they're like three years old or something. And so, therefore, they say that infanticide is okay. I, I'm literally yeah. the same, the fade into so you're gonna this ridiculous lot illegal positivism thing, which is you know, just a naked power play shell game 
yeah. or you end up with this really absurd Peter Singer esque wacko land where it's you know infanticide is okay. Yeah, you know, uh, listen, uh, IP never even said that rights are granted for be for merely being human. That's just something you just so, made up. If you yeah, given those two alternatives, though, the notion of you know, yes, it is a little strange to be calling. I mean, on the one side, it's not strange because it just makes logical sense if you realize that you know it has a you know an essential nature of a human being which is you know therefore it is a human being therefore it's a person because the, the essential nature is to be rational and so on and but it, it does look a little weird when you, you know say like you know you go to the very extreme example of the single cell you know the the egg the sperm and the egg okay yeah you know biologically it doesn't look any different than a protozoan right Yes, I will admit that that seems a little weird to say that's a person, but it, it's it, it's not like it's not so weird as to be philosophically problematic, you know. And all 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 of the models, the two pro-choice ones, the legal positivism and the Peter Singer kind of approach, those have problems, and and this is "quote unquote" our bite the bullet point, okay? But the point is, is if you look at all the bite the bullet points. The notion of having the, the the zygote being a person is a less bad bite the bullet point than the pro choice models. Right. That's uh, all there's to it. I mean, it, it, it's 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 not. Um, yeah, it's a little weird, but let's face it. The the pro choice um, personhood models are are far worse in terms of their ridiculousness when it comes to their bite the bullet points. Right. I I actually want to go back uh, to our messy on Mac was saying that defining pers personhood as self-awareness would not lead to anyone being denied of any right that they would have. But here's the thing. I want to ask, like, where did IP say that define, you know, personhood would, self-awareness would lead to that, would lead to slavery or something like that? IP never said this. And, you know, he said very specifically that the idea of an ad hoc definition of defining personhood of how you see fit can lead to devastating consequences. So you can just define personhood by self-awareness. Someone else can define personhood by however they see fit, by skin color, wherever they are, where, you know, and it leads down to the same path. And we're doing the same thing again with the, the, with the zygote. You know, I, mm -hmm. right. You know, uh, yeah, so let's continue on here. Say because the fetus is not conscious yet. It is not a person. And how do they know this? Because they do not have the experience or knowledge of you or me. Lack of knowledge doesn't mean someone is not a person. People in vegetative states have very low IQs, and no one says they are not persons. The reason we don't treat people in temporary states of unconsciousness, like a coma, as though they have no rights is because this would exacerbate the fear most of us have of ending up in such a state. In other words, it would increase the suffering of those of us who are still conscious. It is for this reason that people who are temporarily unconscious ought to still be treated as persons. Abortion does not have the same ability to disturb our peace of mind because none of us has to worry about ending up as a fetus, and fetuses have no capacity to understand or fear their own mortality he's admitting it right here he's admitting it since he, he got out of the gate safe and sound he has nothing to fear from saying yes we can take the life of a fetus he's basically admitting it right there yeah I know. Well, we're, we're, we're I know out now. Of the gate. yeah now thinking doesn't make you a person because there are people in comas you know in deep sleep or vegetation states none of these people are actually thinking and here's another thing you know your feelings Shouldn't determine someone well, else's. I think he life. might change his mind if uh, Donald Trump decided to legalize post-birth abortions. <laughs> yes, post-birth abortion oh, health yeah. right service. Right, you know, and you know, for you know him saying that the fetus saying doesn't fear, experience fault, fear. Now, this is false. We have studies that show that fetus do experience fear and pain. Just because we may end up in a coma, that doesn't determine personhood. Our precious little feelings do not determine whether something lives or dies or whether something's a person or not, you know? Your, your opinion, your feelings should not determine if someone else lives or dies. And, you know, if someone's in a coma, what if everyone thought, okay, he's not a person anymore, he should just die? It just changed like that. I mean, like, is that how it's going to work? Because this is, this is just some bullshit right here. Yeah, and it so disturbs us the process of uh the the prospect of someone pulling our plug if we were in a coma that that alone is a pretext for granting us personhood 
it, it, it's a complete uh, hedonic calculus argument. It's a yeah. It, it's just to, to maximize our pleasure, in, in our in our waking uh, conscious state. That's what. That's the ultimate determinant of uh, rights and values. It's totally stupid. Like it's just. <laughs> yeah. It's much harder to define, and we have good evidence it is fundamental and not a later developed process. How can you give good evidence regarding something you have trouble even defining? Okay, he didn't have a hard time to define it at all. He defined it as something that's fundamental and something that we can actually study based on his videos. So once again, Manson Mac just lied two seconds just into the video we just saw right now. Just... Again, you know, it's... You know, the more I watch this, it's just so unbelievable. It, it almost hurts my head watching this right now. I, I'm sorry, I have to say that. It's just, um, yeah. He's just tossing out random crap that's going to confirm the prejudices of people who have already made up their mind. That's it. Now, I want to show something interesting. This is kind of, this is going to totally, if the messianic manic is watching this or he's alerted, this is going to totally piss him off. But about this. What you just said about him con having his confirmation bias. I, I've noticed this for a while. You know where his subscriber count is at right now? Well, it's ridiculous, yeah. Well, it's ridiculous. However, there's something like else. About it. It's funny, okay? Yeah. It's at 33,654 subscribers right now. IP passed that. IP was at like 29, 28,000. Guess where the Messianic Manic subscriber count was about? When that happened, yeah. IP has almost picked up ten thousand subscribers. Okay, since last before I saw there, the Messianic Manic in that same time period was at about thirty thousand, thirty-three thousand uh, two hundred subscribers. He's essentially in an echo chamber. He's not growing anywhere. He's like stuck. In, like he's like like stuck at like the thirty-three thousand mark. Yeah. And IP is blowing away, and, and that's what he's doing. That's what happens. You talk to an echo chamber and just reconfirm the same. You don't grow past the echo. He's like stuck at literally at thirty three thousand subscribers. We will pay you money to to feed our opinions back to us. Yes. Yeah, that's all that happens. Yeah. Let's suppose we define a person to be someone who is capable of intentional action. Well, guess what? Science is not on the side of abortion advocates in this case either. Even though consciousness in fetuses is very hard to study, by 14 weeks of age, there is undeniable evidence that fetuses display intentions, and by definition, would be persons. Who uses that definition, though? I don't. By that definition, many non-human animals would be persons. Mice would be persons. I don't think it's enough that the organism be conscious. I think personhood should be contingent upon having a self-concept, rather than merely being conscious. Also, by the definition IP is addressing, an embryo without a nervous system would still not be a person. None of these assertions about the consciousness of the fetus explain why it is wrong to kill a zygote that doesn't even have a nervous system yet. As we <laughs> As we've already established, uh, uh, the 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 born human being does not have a, a self image until they're a few years old. So yeah, yeah but that means basically that by his by his idea, then you know the whole idea of killing infanticide after they're born, yeah, straight up infanticide yeah. would be justified on his on his view. Yeah. You know, there's so much wrong in what he just said. I mean, first of all, I mean, IP, first of all, personhood is about or being human life, but IP addressed that there's good evidence to show that consciousness is not created from the brain activity. And that's shown in case of the soul and case for the, you know, case for a case for the soul series he actually posted on here. And it's a, it's not dependent on the nervous system. In IP's video uh, from Near Death Experience, he gave examples of people who are born without brains or just a sack of fluid in a very thin layer of brain tissue. Who is that one person, Jahan? Do you know who I'm talking about? The, uh, uh, not offhand. Uh, wait, say that again, who was born with yeah. what? It was a person who had a case that was born with a sack of fluid or very thin layer of brain tissue. And it, I'm not uh, sure of the name of that person, but I do remember there was... I'm aware of... I remember that, that yeah. I don't know who it yeah, was. Yeah, I mean, but... there was a case for that. Didn't have a nervous system, but it could still function and walk just like a human. It. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, there was there was even a person who had um, an IQ over one hundred twenty, 
who had just no no actual brain, just the thin layer of brain cells. Well, not brain cells, but ner nerve cells um, coating the inside of his skull, but no actual brain. So, yeah, I know. I, yeah, you know, uh, that doesn't mean that they're not a person just because they don't have a fully developed brain. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's 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 been shown. There's so much evidence on this. Know this: Masonic Man gave not one scientific paper or any evidence at all. This all of it came from his opinion, and you know this, which you know. I think everyone needs to know about this. Masonic Man doesn't argue, you know, from science. He argues from what he wants, what he wants to believe, which is a fairyland. By the by, the way, I, I just pulled this up from a uh, psychology today. I thought it would be relevant to the to the argument, but it says self awareness and the transition from infant to toddler. We suggest that three aspects of development are particularly important in, in helping us understand toddlers. To summarize, at about eighteen months range, uh, uh, one to three years. These three issues emerged to herald the arrival of the toddler, mobility, self-awareness, and language. So at least until the toddler is, is 18 months old, do they have the, the self-awareness. So, so it would fail by that metric. Mm -hmm. Well, what'd you, what, all, uh, what did you all think? <laughs> Painful. Yeah, this is very much cringe. Yes. Hey, he's not even trying at this point. No. I mean... I don't understand. It doesn't make sense to me that... Yes. I, I know completely, yeah. Well, that's the fallout, the fallback. You know, it's well, kind well, of the agnostic position. The, the, the pseudo-skeptic, you know, like, just like, 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 just random arbitrary skepticism, you know? And he doesn't you know, have an opinion of his own, and he... That's his handy fallback. Yeah, I mean, half the stuff he said, IP never said in the first place. He just made up shit and took away it out of context. He, mm -hmm. yep. It's all he ever does, really. Just, yep. Yeah. Well, uh, anything else you want to say and wrap up with this here? No, I have a question uh, to Trevor. I don't know. I don't know, Trevor. Uh, do you have a YouTube channel? Uh. No, I, I, I have a specific YouTube channel. I have a Google account that I, you know, it's, it's, it's this one, but I don't actually, haven't actually uploaded any YouTube videos yet. You got to make some videos, Trevor. Yeah, you, you're kind of getting on you for that. You're an extremely intelligent person. You need a YouTube channel. <laughs> well, I, I, I want to I be able to, uh, you know, do my stuff with, uh, my, with, my, with the startup world and all of that. And I don't want to, you know, get like a rep, build up a reputation and then have it pop up at an investor meeting or something like that, and then have to go through all those questions. Well, that would even be relevant. I mean, that's your that's your private activity. That's your personal it, life. Like it, it's sort of relevant. It, it's sort of relevant. So like, it's kind of stupid. I mean, I mean like you'd be like, do, yeah, that's my hobby online. online. Like none of your what business. I'm is, what, what I'm thinking is, I might like, I might set up like a channel where like I use like a voice manipulator or something, and then give all these arguments. Uh, behind some sort of mask, I might do that sometime, sometime in the near future. Oh, you but, could do like uh, logic does it. Yeah. You use yeah, but, but I definitely want like, to protect have... my personal identity at like all costs. But I, but you know, I don't think that there are that many people who are watching something like this. So yeah. I'll, I'll come on to these sorts of things, obviously. Yeah, just but, yeah. Get a little cartoon avatar where you where you can people can make eye contact through. You. Uh, with you through the cartoon avatar, so yeah, yeah that would probably help. Okay, then. Um, so, I guess this is the end of the podcast. Unless anything we want to talk about, anything else about quantum mechanics or anything about abortion. <laughs> Opened up that can of worms. Well, this has already been a very long. And now we're back yeah, to it's quantum. Been, it's been a while. <laughs> I mean, you know, I was, I've been well, thinking actually, guys. I've been thinking of a number of videos, like in the kind of like the Johan and Rots present series, and I've been realizing you can do stuff with Hoffman's uh, conscious realism. Um, I, I talked to you know I pointed out McHugh the other day that you can derive his whole gift theory, which is like a model of redemption from the premise, the, the principles that you see in Hoffman's conscious realism. Remember that? Oh yeah, I remember that. And the thing about it is, is, is I want to do like a comparative religion thing. On um, 
So you use Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, and New Age as all examples. They have different aspects, different Wait, you're, beliefs you're, you're, that don't, don't don't unironically use New Age. Get get something like get something else like uh, Taoism or something. Well, no, no. The reason for this is the reason for this is the reason I was picking these <laughs> is because they all have features in them regarding the fallen state. They don't. Re they're different. They're, they're different features though. Well, I, I know, and the thing like, about it is, is, is they're not is... things that you would see if you belong to any one of those six groups. You will not see. I'm going to mention that, like, it actually comes from Hermeticism, which is, you know, like, it, it's not. It, it's, okay. it's influenced okay. by that. Yeah. If, you, if you if you mention Hermeticism instead of making it yeah. sound like the age is actually because yeah, I, I, I. But I'm going to say it's a popular belief system, and it's not really from there originally. It kind of got into the New Age from this, but it's actually originally a Hermetic concept, right? Okay, that, that, and that's that, why I'm, I'm going to briefly, but I'm going to point out that this is a popular view. But the thing is, is in the New Age community. But the thing is, is that there are these six separate things, and if you were to go into any one of those belief systems, like be a person in those belief systems, you would not see the other six components, other other aspects. Okay, you'd only see the ones in your own belief set. But what's crazy is when you derive what the fallen state would be on like a quantum idealist model, which you can derive in a very rigorous fashion from Hoffman's no conscious realism. When you get like the big metaphysical framework, you're going to see that all of the fallen state, all the things attributed to the fallen state and all those six different systems pop out of the same model simultaneously. Mm. How's that for crazy? So it has, it has predictive power in a way that people didn't even think and that it can actually explain you know, you think everyone looks at comparative religion of like, oh, there's some influence on religions, but you know, from a materialistic framework, the only one sees that as like there's this religious construct. People just man made religions, you know, the religious ideas, right? They kind of pop up and they're medic and they have no, well, yeah, but then they're you, all disconnected. The but bring in the physics and point out there's actually a framework to explain this yeah. with. And by the way, this framework not only explains. The, it explains stuff in multiple religions simultaneously. And that, what it does then is that it shows people that when people are having these religious ideas, they're not just random, you know, human BS that was created by, you know, it was created by people and then it was all independent. And the fact that it's all different is evidence that it's just random human creation. Yeah. What we're going to point out, though, is that since they're all coming to different pick aspects of the same picture, they're actually studying a real thing. And what the good analogy is the blind man and the elephant. There are six, you know, blind men, blind scholars studying the elephant, right? You're all familiar with the blind man and the elephant story, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the thing is, they're all studying different. And they're all arguing. You're wrong. No, I'm right. No, it's like a snake. No, it's like a rope. No, it's like a fan, etc. Right? And they're all arguing this: a tree trunk, a wall, a, uh, a spear. And they're all they're all right, right? Yeah. So now the thing about this is, is the atheist is going to see these six different accounts of the blind men of the elephant, right? And he's going to say, well, which god of these of uh, these six are there? I mean, there's all these different gods. It's all just a bunch of you. And whether or not you were born in, you know, this time period of Earth and in that part of ge ge uh, geography, you be be believing this system rather than that and so on. Well, I'm going to point out that what's really going on here is they're all interacting with the same underlying reality. And they're picking up different aspects of the same underlying reality independently because they're basically operating in a blind man and the elephant thing. But when you take the blinders off and put this whole Hoffmanian conscious realism slash quantum idealism model onto it, right? You're going to suddenly realize that this notion of a fallen state can actually be rigorously defended on the metaphysics and the physics. Yeah. So There's actually a way to translate theology into physics when you take the blind. You, you begin saying, you know, you know, it's you know, everyone has this notion of God as this this you know mysterious man in the sky that we believe on faith and dogma and so on. The only atheists like that. <laughs> but no, but there, there, some Christians do too, though, is the problem. Or even ones that believe there is evidence. You know, like they, they'll say that you can't. Even someone like you know as reputable as William Lane Craig, you know, he he has like a very you know solid philosophic basis for God. He's not a fundamentalist by any stretch of the imagination. But there's going to be certain things that they believe on faith that they you know you can't really. You can't argue past a certain because it's, it's like, well, we believe that we don't really understand the supernatural, though, so that we can't really, we know the supernatural exists because of these reasons for philosophy of mind and these reasons for the cosmological argument and so on. We can't really get into what it is because it's outside, the supernatural is outside of human comprehension, as it were, right? 
well, if the whole quantum idealism thing is true, which you know it can also be translated into the, the Hoffman conscious realism thing, it's not a mystery. Yeah. God is a matter of physics. And if you take the idealism thing, that means that the supernatural is a matter of physics as well, right? Or yeah. what people call the supernatural, which means what people have been calling theology all this time for, you know, all these millennia, there's actually an underlying reality that they've been interacting with. And the reason we haven't been seeing this, we reason we've been dichotomizing this and saying there's this realm of science and this realm of faith, right? Is because people have for the longest time, you know, as Hoffman pointed out, they've, they've evolved to like have this naive realist view of the world where there's material objects out there. And that's not how the world really works. And because yeah. of that, there's this artificial conceptual dichotomy that's been produced. And because this artificial dis conceptual dichotomy exists, therefore we think that there is this, we've been, we've been interacting with another aspect of this conceptual dichotomy that was there all along, but we didn't see it because of our cognitive biases and because of how we're programmed to see reality. Yeah. And now only in the 21st century we're able to see this and we're like, Oh, this is there the whole time. This is what you've been interacting with this whole time that you've been seeing as this, you know, this realm of faith, the supernatural that's beyond human comprehension, et cetera. It's not, it's just, it's just really weird thing and you can actually begin once you realize that that's that's what religion was interacting with this whole time so so say, it, would, it would almost be a refutation of the nietzsche and uh 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 kind of a uh, uh what do you call a genealogical view of morality and religion yeah exactly it, 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 that they're interacting they're blind men interacting with an elephant at different points yeah. in history at different and it, there's little pieces coming through that are true and they don't get the whole. Here's another good example. We okay? all have a we all have a sense of the divine before we're exposed to any cultural influence. Right, right. And we're interacting, and 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 not just that, but the divine exists as a reality, and it's been interacting, right? Yes. And because it's been interacting, people have recorded these interactions through history, and they've written things down about them, and and they all seem separate because they're not able to see this reality, right? Because they're they're they're. You know, by evolution or by you know cognitive the way their 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 cognitive functions work, they're not able to see it because it's it's a you know Hoffman gets into this whole thing of how we're limited in our thinking. It's kind of because it takes a you know it takes um, yeah. Plantinga's evolutionary argument against naturalism to a whole new level and says, wait a minute, this thing is is not just you know a a philosophical troll on the atheist. This is there's actually things where this could be true, and there may be a, a deeper level of reality we're not able to see because of our cognitive biases. Yeah, that are programmed in from birth and all that, and and once we remove that, we can show them that there is this other reality there, that was there the whole time that they're interacting with, and it can be explained by science. You can actually begin converting theology into science. I'm going to uh, throw a whole a whole other name into the mix that you're probably going to dread, but it kind of reminds me of of uh, Terence McKenna, where he says that he, he compared the uh, the brain to like a radio, and basically it's tuned to a certain station. Uh, uh, due to just to ev due to evolutionary pressures. Yes, oh yeah, we need. To so here's another example. I wanted to oh, go ahead. I wanted to bring this in because this is very fascinating. Yes. Um, here's another example of something I want to do in the future. It's on the notion of demons and angels. Okay, and I'm going to point something out. Some things that, from the religious perspective, don't make sense, and from like the atheist perspective, that don't make sense regarding yeah. this. And there's something. Okay, the whole notion of tuning into the different radio station. Okay. Yeah. It actually has a direct analog in um, quantum mechanics of the notion of Hilbert space. You're on this frequency or that frequency, and that's part of what I think is being hidden, as it were. Right Now, when you think about this, there is this... Um, uh, Verlinde calls this mond, okay? It's modifying Newtonian dynamics. And he has this idea... Very, and explains dark matter and dark energy very well, where all this stuff is coming from. And what he has is a very fascinating concept of, okay, you know how space-time is emergent, right? We talked about yeah. that before. Okay, what if there is a deeper, there's this deeper reality underneath space-time, okay? Now, we would normally think of that deeper reality as, number one, it's non-physical, right? It's not in space-time, so therefore it's non-physical. If we take quantum cognition seriously, say everything in the wave function is cognitive, and therefore mental, and you could say, therefore, quote-unquote, spiritual, unquote, right? Yeah. Well, okay, so it's spiritual and non-physical. What does that make it? Supernatural. That's conventionally what everyone has referred to as, quote-unquote, supernatural, even though 
in reality, it's just another level of reality, right? That we can study with science and so on. Now, the thing about this is, is here's where it gets weird, okay? From God's perspective, it's you know, a big mind container, larger consciousness system, as, as um, Tom Campbell would say it, right? I, I wouldn't know. Um, you have, um, you can derive, okay. So basically, he calls it the larger consciousness system. Anyway, though, you have this thing where, from his perspective, it's all in the wave function. It's all mental. It's all spiritual, right? So let's suppose I'm going to pull something really weird out here, okay? Okay, so there is this notion in religion that, you know, has been believed for a very long time, you know? And it's believed in, you know, the Muslims call them jinn and iblis. Uh, Christians call them Familiar. demons and the devil and so on. There's angels. Um, Hinduism has, you know, it's angels and demons. Buddhism has demons, believe it or not. You know, it, it's a, Judaism does it. It's, it's a popular thing, right? Yeah. And, um, hold on here. What am I doing? Uh, I'm going to ask like, if you can wrap this up in a few okay, minutes. Okay, okay. So. Basically, basically, the concept is is if, depending on, if you're in one of these other bubble realities that exists in this is Hilbert space that you call supernatural, Yeah. you would see it, if you're within it, you'd see it as physical, right? It would be flesh and blood, physical, right? If you're outside of it, though, it would be outside space-time in the wave function. It would be non-physical and therefore supernatural, right? Yeah. Now, here's the weird part. Whether or not it is considered supernatural, once you realize the way this reality really works, whether or not it's considered supernatural is strictly dependent on your frame of reference, whether you're in this vibration frequency, shall we say, this uh, Hilbert space you know, frequency domain, or this other one here, right? Yeah. Your reality is being decoded on this quantum wavelength. You know, this wave function is collapsing to produce these impressions versus you're on this other other set of wave functions somewhere else in Hilbert space that are producing these other sets of empirical, you know, this other computer program, as it were, right? Yeah. So now here's the bizarre thing. In the Bible, and I always always wondered about this when I was growing up. Everyone just kind of takes this for granted, but when I was growing up, I was like, you know, questioning, like, we believe the devil exists, we believe angels exist, but what is going on here? And I had this example, you know, in um, the Bible, it explicitly says that the Israelites ate the bread of angels, right? Manna, right? And I thought to myself, well, if they, you know, you have this, they eat the bread of angels, right? Well, okay, whatever they're eating, their digestion is, it's something they can digest, right? It's something that can be processed by their digestive system. Therefore, it's something they can give them nutrients. Therefore, if you look at a level of biochemistry, whatever it is made of, it has to be made of chemicals and atoms, yeah, right? Material substance, yeah. Mater what we call material substance. But there's something really wrong about this if it's the bread of angels. It's material substance being eaten by angels. Material substance that can be processed, digested, and converted. And, you know, the number one would mean that if angels are eating it, they have a digestive system, right? Number two, if they're digesting it, that means they're processing it into their body structure. Their body structure is made of what we would call as atoms. Here's another example. Uh, you know, the, the serpent in Genesis, and you have, likewise, um, you know, the dragon in Revelation, all that. You know, that's the, the description of the devil, right? Well, you think, well, the devil is a supernatural being. He doesn't have physical form, etc., right? Yeah. Well, snakes and dragons have biological features such as scales. Mm. Those are evolved traits. If that's to be taken literally... You have this weird situation where you're giving the devil biological traits, the, the traits you would expect of biological organisms. Can, can I ask you a very important question here? Yep. And uh, what do you make uh, then of the of the resurrected body of Jesus? Does that figure in, into the equation? Oh yeah, it's made of it's made of atoms. It's 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 made of because those are part of um you know it's part of the programming of our. Yes, you know. and then he ascended into heaven. So, so what would that be? Well, that's weird because that means he's got a biological body up in a supernatural realm, and so we have this really weird situation where, you know, the, if you look at this carefully, you treat this all literally. 
you see that what are called demons and angels, and you might end up with some theologian saying, well, that, you treat them as figurative, etc. And well, no, that's if you look at what they actually believe back then, that's not what they believe. You know, they had they had this whole thing, you know, like they, the Hebrews believed in the Nakash, you know, which was the serpent in Genesis. And they thought there was serpent seed and there's this whole other. They actually believe this is, you know, you go back to what, where the belief originated. This is what they believed that these were these, these, what, you know, Jacob wrestled with an angel, okay? Yeah. How do you wrestle with a being if it's, you know, non corporeal? Hmm. Right, and so the weird thing about all this is, is this stuff is all physical, right? Or what you would see is physical, and yet it's called supernatural. And so, what I recognize is that you can take this stuff, and you can say that whether or not it's physical or not is simply dependent on which frequency you're tuned into. Yeah, I, and so I, it's really I, crazy because you can have flesh and blood. You know, it's just on a different, and it could be a world very similar to ours. You know, with um, it could even be Earth just on some different. A different Hilbert space. Well, that's, that's exactly Earth. the thing with Terence McKenna is that he thought D, uh, DMT was a gateway to this elf world, and I, it's not something I'll admit to uh, an atheist because, of course, they would call me crazy anyway. But I'm inclined. To Are not... you still on the air? Are you still on the air? I'm here. Yeah, we're still on. Yeah, actually, okay. I, I think we need to wrap up. Yeah, let's right. get off the air soon. <laughs> like, then we can open up our yeah, true yes, opinions like, and everything. It's, it's, it's anyway, though, what I'm here. saying is you can convert everything in theology into essentially, once you have this Hoffman model, you can convert theology into physics. Yeah. And you can do it from a physics first point of view, so it doesn't even doesn't even look like you're using theology at first. You can like my Trinity video recently. I pop the Trinity out of semantic logic and Hoffman's conscious realism. Seems very interesting. I just pop the whole thing out and you know, it's all physics. And the thing is, you can, I recognize this, that, 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 that this whole time they've been, religion has been, it's not a mystery at all. It was a mystery before we didn't know how reality really worked. But there's this, you know, this whole time, religion has been interacting with this other world and taken as this realm of faith that we can't understand how reality works, how the supernatural reality works. We just we take it on faith and it's beyond human comprehension, etc. No, it's just functionally been that way for a long time because our minds are not programmed to see reality as it is. Yes. And I, once we see our reality out is we can just pull the mask off and say, by the way, this is all science, guys. Oh, wait, it's also theology. And, you know, McHugh, for example, he had that whole model of the redemption he was showing, right? And he had, he was able to describe it. And I, I broke, the, broke it down like a set of principles. And I broke those principles further down to conscious realism. I can now create and explains why the Christian redemption model is correct and uh, why like 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 the mecha the reasoning behind it right before you just took it on faith like this is all kind of a mystery and so on right and you can then connect that to um you, the title of the same model I used to describe the fallen state I can now create a completely physics based explanation for the basic essential Christian story, the fallen state and the redemption. Yeah. It's all physics. I can present it as physics. It's very interesting. Some food. And then pop out and say, uh, oh, and by the way, guess what? This was seen this before and by religion. Yeah. You know, they all describe the fallen state, though Christianity has the correct view on the the redemption model. And, and made it made it made made high physics comprehensible to the masses. Yeah. So what I want to see is, and you can do the same thing with the afterlife. You can point out the whole. Here's another example: the whole spirit soul dichotomy. And people don't even reckon. Most religious people don't even understand what, yeah. what this is for. What that's for? Can you know? My grandma dies of Alzheimer's, right? And she, you know, her brain decayed, her cognitive functions decayed, and so rather atheists would say, well, when she dies, she, the whole brain should just shut off. I mean, you know, why would the cognitive functions just decay and then, or they suddenly all come back in the afterlife, right? Yeah. Well, the reason for this is is that the soul would decay, right? Because the soul, what the soul is, when you look at what the spirit and the soul is in the Bible, you look at it very carefully, what they're talking about, the soul is simply, and you, you recognize what the distinction is, you take the whole quantum idealism thing, and you can kind of see like the all the lights turn on, you see what's really being talked about. Basically, the soul is simply, the, the spirit is the, is the consciousness outside space time, the soul is simply the projection of the spirit into a biological avatar huh? in space-time. Yeah. And so when you have this spirit-soul dichotomy, you realize well, the soul can decay in the avatar, 
And once it dies, all the quantum information just leaks back up into Hilbert space and re-entangles with the spirit, and you got all your consciousness back. Well, that's what I always felt, is, is that the spirit was kind of being poured through a sieve, and the sieve can be, like, narrow, or, or it, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's an avatar, It's no, and it's no different than you would have an avatar in a computer game. Yeah, oh, but like putting it through a spaghetti strainer or something. Yeah, exactly, that's that's narrow. what's going on. It, it's it's yeah. a... It's it's the computer game. It's yourself in the computer game. Your identity in the computer game. Your identity outside the computer game. Yes. So we're talking. About, <laughs> we're talking about computer games, DMT, uh, spaghetti strainers. <laughs> yeah. So the thing is, with this, it explains the afterlife. And elves. And yeah. you can start digging into stuff. I, I've done a lot of research into comparative religion and esoteric systems and so on. And I'm able to see that you can actually pull out a completely coherent theological model that explains everything you normally believe in Christianity: the afterlife, the the fallen state, the salvation by grace concept, the you know the notion of there being these other being demons and angels essentially, and all this can be just translated into a science model. Well, we know what we know what TMM would say. You'd say I don't even understand what having a spirit. Right, I know. But what I'm saying is, I can present this in a way. You know, I can dumb this down to an. You know, like you saw my mental universe video. It was a very popular level science documentary. I could dump, I wanted to do this for like the fallen state, like a similar documentary for that. I can just promote this stuff there, and you can suddenly start basically translating all of theology into. We pull the rug away and say, "Oh, by the way, this whole time, all this religion stuff can be explained with with physics." Maybe we should have it on different podcasts. Yeah, like next time. That, that's certainly a worthy discussion. Yeah, but for now, I think we need to wrap this. Uh, right yeah, now. we got to wrap it up, yeah. man. Um, All right, let's anyways, let's, let's let's recap with everything we have. Okay, so all right, all right, so this was one hell of a podcast we did. Yeah. But uh, how many do you want to bet that Mess Out Man's working on a response right now? If you watch this, <laughs> if you watch this, I don't know if he did, but it'll be kind of interesting. Yeah. Well, it's very long. It makes, it makes great demands on the time. Yeah. Right. That's very true. But you know, if he ever does make a response, uh, do you guys feel like doing our podcast about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, be be a nine-hour podcast. Yeah, all right. Then, and if he doesn't do a response, I figure we can move on to something else. Uh, I personally want to do a podcast in the future with the Rational Channel. I have a bone to pick with them, actually. So they're a top how can you? They say, they say they're the Rational Channel. That must mean you're irrational. No, no, they're 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 called the Retarded Channel. That the, the they're they're they they should be called the Retarded Channel. I mean, they're very. Very condescending. Well, you know, you know, when, whenever atheists proclaim their reason and their rationality with their names of their organizations and their name of the YouTube channels, they are basically uh, uh, doing a demonstration of of the Dunning Kruger effect. <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. That, that's what it is. It's becoming more and more obvious. I mean, beforehand they kind of had a case because all the theists had they were operating under this dualist lens, you know, or you know, the blinders were on. And they had, uh, you know, they had the creationist wave. They had the William Lane Craig wave was the best wave because they had, you know, they could get to a point there and they could defend, they could hold their own, but they really weren't, you know, they, they, that's all they were really doing was pulling even. And then they had the presuppositionalist wave, which is just sort yeah, of amazing. Mean, so yeah, the, the thing about this, uh, sorry, yeah, the, go the, ahead. The thing about this is, is we got this quantum idealism thing now. None of this stuff is, you know, irrational or in the realm of, you know, just blind faith, et cetera. This is all. And they're being crushed by the physics and the philosophy of mind. They're just being like they're just like being annihilated, and they can't they can't take it. And it's it's cool because we just to keep going with this, and this all they have left is Dunning Kruger. Before they thought they had this whole the whole science versus religion, faith versus reason dichotomy was based on dualism. The atheists were just simply taking the material half of the dualism, you know, and saying, "Well, we can understand this, we can't understand the, the immaterial, so therefore." It's, you know, you can't reason about it, so therefore anyone who is claiming and making claims about it is stupid and irrational and so on. Well, if you go idealism, it changes the scientific version of idealism. That changes the whole picture. There's no longer this dichotomy. And their whole grounds for calling themselves more rational and being the champions of science, etc. The whole basis on which they're doing that, the whole thing collapses. Mm, yes, right. You can just steamroll out, bring all the physics out of the, the woodwork and say this is what's really going on the whole time. And they're like, you know, what do they, what do they say? Mm. 
Well, yeah. So we will we will mirror this on all our channels. I think we should, we should give a plug for our channels. Oh, okay. If we're doing that, then Johan, I want to talk to you on Facebook really quick about something. Okay. After. Okay. All right, keep then. keep the keep the discussion going while it's like take it off live and then we yeah, can keep talking yeah. after. Yeah, something like that. Uh, anyways, thank you for all for coming. And uh, you know, if Mason Command wants to make a response, I I I challenge him to use scientific evidence and research to show that. Give me a paper that says that the fetus is part of the woman's body. Give me a paper that argues against what all of us just say. You know, not just from his opinion. Give us some scientific facts. Would y'all agree? Yes. Yeah. So like, like a three all right. Hour hangout, by the way. How long was this hangout? Yeah. Uh, I think I'm not exactly sure. I think it was like two and a half hours, but we should end it now. Anyways, yeah. thank you guys for coming. Until next time. See ya. All right. See ya. All right. Take it easy, Bye. guys. Say goodbye. All right. Are we live still? Still live. Yep. Yep.